I spend my days as a humble worker at 7-Eleven. More specifically, I was a store manager and franchise owner. I was no software engineer or doctor. And while my family did have their opinions on what I did for a living, my job paid rather well. I was a very different man in my past. But deciding to go the route of franchising a store was a more hands-on career path that mostly kept me in check. It was a low stress but high labor job, and that was honestly perfect for me. The job was almost therapeutic to me. It gave me something to take care of, something to look forward to every day. Of course, I couldn't do this alone. Working with me in my daytime shifts were workers Molly and Adam. Molly and Adam were young. They were working there to pay off their college tuition. We all considered ourselves like a family to each other. Molly, Adam, and I grew super close to each other in our time working there. They were like the kids I never had, and this naturally made me a little protective over them. We would always encounter weird or upset customers, and it was usually me who had to stand up for them. I didn't want anything to happen to them. They were so young. Nothing bad had happened to Molly or Adam yet, and I was grateful for that. But one early morning, that changed. It was a Tuesday morning. I want to say the incident occurred around 9 a.m. The sun was out and things seemed to be going normal. This time of day was always peaceful. There was usually never any problems. Eventually, a blue sedan pulled into the parking lot. Inside of the car was a rather average looking middle aged man. He stepped out of the car and started filling it with gas. While the pump was going, he then proceeded to the front of the store. As per their training, Molly and Adam greeted him. The man just nodded and started walking around the aisles. He then looped back around the store, approached Molly, and started flirting with her. Molly was visibly uncomfortable, and while I wanted to go to the back of the store and do my inventory logging, I couldn't do this, not with the man hitting on Molly like that. Adam, however, told me that he could handle the man if he started acting any weirder, and naturally, I trusted him. I reluctantly stepped in the back room and started counting down and logging all the items that were there. While I was doing this, however, I kept looking back towards the man to see what he was doing. It seemed like the man was looking back at me as well. This was odd for a number of reasons. Customers aren't supposed to be this close to the back of the store, and he kept awkwardly peering in through the utility room. To make things worse, every time I looked back, the man started to try and act busy. It was like he was trying to pass time or look natural for some reason. I stepped out of the room and asked the man if I could help him. He seemed to awkwardly and rudely shun me off and keep pacing around the store pretending like he was looking for something. For some reason, I decided to ignore all these red flags and continue my work in the back. Eventually, while Molly was passing by the back room, she whispered to me that the man was making her very uncomfortable. I told her that once I finished with the shelf I was working on, I would quickly go outside and help her. I essentially told her to hang in there and wait behind Adam. It was super confusing what the man even wanted. He seemed to have stopped flirting with Molly completely and was instead focused on trying to peer through the back door for some reason. As annoying as this was, I just wanted to get through my work. I had one last crate of granola bars to log down and I didn't want this weird man to stop that. But that's when I heard a commotion coming from the main room. Excuse me sir, you're not allowed to be back there, what are you trying to pull off? Call the police Adam, I heard Molly exclaim right after that. I quickly ran out of the storage room to see what was happening and saw the commotion. The man in the blue car was trying to pull something off. I saw Molly in shock and fear in the corner and Adam with his fists up standing right in front of her. Hey, what do you think you're doing? I asked the man. Whoa, 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 what kind of place is this? What's even back there? What are you guys hiding? Get out of here. The sign clearly says employees only. You expect me to just sit here and let you get away with this? No way in hell. We were all in complete shock. Adam tried to calm the man down, however. Sir, we don't need to get violent, okay? You can just calm down and we don't have to- I don't want to hear another word from you psychos. The man snapped back at Adam. Molly started to cry. She was ready to dart out the store. The man then started reaching for his pocket. We had no idea what he was going to pull out. I tackled the man in the back of the shop and screamed at Adam and Molly to just head away and call the police. A few more minutes of us rustling in the utility room occurred. I managed to headlock the man but he just kept hitting me off. After a few more minutes of us rustling and fighting in the back, the cops eventually got there. But sadly, they couldn't find him on the scene. We got the man's face on security camera and his car was still at the pumps. We had both his face and his license plate on camera. Despite all this, the police just left. They couldn't find any sign of him and they assumed that he just ran out through one of the other back doors. As the cops left, I made sure to dump the man's body right next to the first. As I mentioned before, I was a different man in my past. This job really changed me. It seemed like the man in the blue car clearly noticed the other body I had 
Normally it's pretty well hidden, not even Molly or Adam could find it. But I guess one of the legs must have been sticking out or something like that while I was moving stuff around. I re-looked at the security footage to make sure there was no evidence left behind. It seemed like the man wasn't reaching for a gun or a knife, he was reaching for his phone to call the police. I really didn't want it to be this way, but he knew my secret. The man was now part of my collection. Molly and Adam still have no idea what happened, and you bet I'm planning to keep it that way. They can't find out anything about my past. If they did, they'd be shattered. For now, my secret remains safe from the public eye, and I will ensure no one remembers that day. It was a somewhat nippy autumn night, and I was about halfway into my shift. I was a young man, and I took up any job I really could at the time. In this case, it was a late shift at 7-Eleven. In the United States, 7-Elevens are open 24 hours a day and 7 days a week. This meant that someone had to take up that horrid night shift, and that person was me. As much as the job messed up my sleep schedule, it did help me do my coursework during the day, and it did pay a bit better than the normal shifts. I've been told that working in a convenience store is among the most dangerous jobs in the states, and this claim was honestly understandable. Although my city is decently safe, the people who go to 7-Elevens late at night are a lot different than your normal shopper. From what I saw, it was either crazy crackheads higher than a kite, or a bunch of drunken teenagers falling all over the place trying to make another booze run. This was extremely annoying. My coworker Colin and I were largely responsible for kicking these people out. And while it was an inconvenience, it never got truly out of hand or unsafe. This all changed one Thursday night, however. My coworker Colin had some sort of family emergency to take care of, and this resulted in him having to skip a few shifts. This meant that I was in charge of handling the dreaded 8pm to 4am shift completely alone. This truly annoyed me. Colin was a really chill guy. His conversations made the hours go by much faster, and without him, I'd just be alone in some dirty store in the middle of the night. Regardless, I received my orders from my manager, and I had to do what I had to do. I arrived at my shift around 5 minutes late as usual, and things were initially going by completely normal. The people that walked in consisted of the usual late night shoppers and people in their pajamas stopping for gas last minute. It seemed like a completely normal weekday night at first. But then, a little past the midnight hour, things got really strange. It was 12.15 at night, and I was sitting on my small chair next to the counter. I had just plugged in my phone into a charger, as it was running low on battery from using it all night. And that's when I noticed a car pull up to one of the pumps. It was a large black SUV. The windows in the back were either completely shattered, or lazily replaced with cardboard and duct tape. A tall and rather large built man stepped out in a trench coat and boots. He turned over to the front door of the store and started to calmly approach it. I just kept glancing at my phone however. Most people walk in, quickly get something and leave. There was no need for formalities at this hour. You call this customer service? The man said in a low, husky voice. It took me a second or two to process that. The people who come in here, especially at this time, aren't exactly expecting award-winning service. Oh, I'm um, sorry sir, is there anything I can get for you? The man just laughed. Oh kid, there's nothing you can get for me. But there is something you can do. At first, I thought the man was going to ask for some weird sexual favor. Funnily enough, I'd been asked this before while I was on the job. You see, I'm not a young man like you. My joints, they don't function like they used to. And you see my car over there? Well, it could use a wash and fill. The man's attitude and overall demeanor were really weird. The way the guy was talking was unsettling as it is. I mean, if the guy could walk all the way over here just fine, why couldn't he fill his own gas or wash his own windshield? However, state law says I have to assist any handicapped or impaired customers if they request it. There was no handicapped sticker on the man's car or any sign that he was disabled in any way. But hey, if they request it, I have to help them. All right, sir, give me a moment, I replied as I placed my phone to the side. I then turned on the pump for my control panel and started heading towards the car. Ha! Ah, look at those youthful muscles work. I love to see it. For whatever reason, I ignored the man's creepiness and continued heading towards the car. The sooner I cleaned his windshield and filled his tank, the sooner he'd be out of there. At least that's what I hoped. As I stepped out of the building, the man seemed to remain in the store. He seemed to be browsing up and down the shelves or something. Whatever. I got to the vehicle. And sure enough, the gas cap was wide open and ready for me. As I was filling the van with gas, I couldn't help but think about what the man said. 
He seemed honestly fine and was totally capable of putting a nozzle in the gas tank. It made me wonder why I was even out there in the first place. But hell, if I could just get this weirdo out of there, I could get back inside to just messing around with my phone. After about a minute or two, the tank was full and it was time for me to wash the man's windshield. As I stepped around towards the back of the van, however, I heard the back door shut. As weird as this was, keep in mind the car was really beaten down and old. It's kind of expected for a car like that to make weird noises, especially on a windy night like this one. I quickly pulled out the sponge and squeegee and started to get to work. But as I was cleaning the glass, that's when I felt it. The discomfort. The odd sensation of being watched or stalked. As I turned around, I felt a hand go over my eyes, and soon my mouth. I barely had any time to comprehend what was even happening. One second I was cleaning glass and the next I was being headlocked. I then heard the familiar sound of the front door to the store opening, and heavy footsteps coming my way. Too many thoughts were racing through my head at this moment, but somehow, somewhere, I mustered everything I had and flung myself as back hard as I could. The person holding me down crashed into the gas pump and shrieked in pain. Damn it, Carl, the tall man said. I rolled back onto my feet and sprinted as hard as I could, my breath getting heavier and heavier every large stride I made. I managed to run across into a neighborhood and dive into the bushes, slowly peeping my head out to see if they were still following me in the van. After the longest ten or so minutes of my life, my adrenaline died down and I finally got the courage to step out of the bush. Just as I was about to call my manager and then the cops, it hit me. My phone was still in the store, charging. Thankfully, however, a close friend of mine lived in the neighborhood I ran away towards. I knocked on his door and told him everything. Naturally, we called the police. When we went back to the station after the police told us they'd arrived, my manager was already there. Somehow, my manager and the police were as or more surprised than I was. Things like this rarely happen in my city. We always considered it a safe place. The police immediately looked through the CCTV footage as my manager suggested, and what we saw shocked us even more. When I had stepped out to wash and fill the van, the man jumped over the counter and tried to find and disable the security cameras in their footage. He couldn't manage to do this, so he just stepped outside and decided that deleting the footage wasn't worth all the time. We managed to capture the men's faces on video right after I made my escape. We then submitted the footage to the higher level police to see what was happening. It turns out, the men were known human traffickers and were on the run from previous kidnappings. The license plate on the van seemed to be fraudulent or stolen, as the numbers only matched a completely different vehicle on the other side of the state. The investigators believed that the men stopped by my city on the way to somewhere else, as they figured it was a safer area and people wouldn't expect them to be there. I quit my job at 7-Eleven immediately after that. The event scarred me. Every time I stepped into another gas station, I would always get reminded of how I almost got kidnapped. Needless to say, I would never pick up a job like that again. It was a normal Saturday like any other. While most people were having fun or enjoying their weekend, I was cooped up behind a register. I worked at 7-Eleven, and let's just say when you're in my financial situation, you don't really get a huge choice of what you can do over weekends. And while I could make a whole video on how much I hated mopping floors while my richer friends were out having fun, I wanted to get something off my chest. Something more serious more sinister. I was working the primetime shift between 12 and 8. During this time of year, this is usually when the crowds of people get the largest. The area I live in is quite affluent. I mentioned this before, but my neighbors and my friends are quite rich. This led to a more interesting demographic with my customers. Wealthier people don't tend to shop at gas station convenience stores unless they have to. Most of them end up buying from premium grocery stores down the road. Unless it was some sort of necessity or emergency, no one really went inside, and even if they did, it was always something along the lines of a water bottle or some food or a snack for the road. The result of this was people mostly just serving themselves at the pump and me just sitting and doing nothing. As boring as this was, I honestly enjoyed just sitting and chilling out while people served themselves. This gave me the opportunity to do some schoolwork or listen to music. On weekends during this time of year, however, this dynamic changed. On weekends, there were junior soccer tournaments in local regions. These kids league soccer competitions meant that travelers would either go into or through our town. This also meant that I had to work a little harder. People were getting more than just water, it would always be something like towels or hand sanitizers or the occasional coffee for the tired chaperone. 
Being fully aware it was soccer season, I really wasn't surprised at all that there were various large SUVs or minivans constantly pulling into the station. After all, youth soccer is very, very popular in the United States. But bear in mind, this was only during the rush hours. The flurry of cars would only come in right before the game started or right after they ended. Nothing really in between. So when a minivan with a chaperone sticker on the side pulled in at around 3pm, I was obviously confused. These games usually end at around 5pm. That means the rush hour starts at around 5.30 when everyone's leaving. But I said hell with it. Minivans are among the most popular vehicles in the US. Would it really be that uncommon for someone to just own one? And besides, a lot of things could have happened. Maybe a kid got injured and they had to leave early. Maybe they were getting gas now to avoid the rush hour later. Again, a smart choice. So I just resumed scrolling on my phone. But after several minutes, the van was still there. This is obviously not a normal amount of time for a vehicle to stop. But after the few long, awkward minutes went by, the driver stepped out. The driver was a scruffy, middle-aged man. He had a somewhat long beard, but seemed overall unkempt. He then tried to fill the car with gas. He seemed to struggle for a few minutes trying to get the pump to work. The pump seemed to be having problems with his credit card reader. This wasn't all too uncommon. Our transaction processing system likes to reject cards it thinks are fraudulent, but off late it's been acting up and rejecting normal cards. The man walked into the store, and I greeted him like I usually do. Welcome in, sir, I told the man. The man sort of angrily ignored what I said and walked up to the counter. As intimidating as this was, I've had my fair share of angry customers. It's something I'd been through. The damn pump. It ain't taking my card. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Our systems are kind of weird. Would you like to pay with cash instead? Fine, just take this. I need to go use the bathroom. The man left me with a wad of $10 bills and then went to use the bathroom. Clearly, the guy was having a bad day. I better get that pump rolling quick. So I opened up the terminal and tried to get things running. However, this wasn't working either. Normally customers can walk in and prepay a certain amount of cash at a certain pump, but it looked like the terminal wasn't responding itself. Something was genuinely wrong with this pump. The man was still in the bathroom, and I really wasn't in the mood to go and tell him that he had to move his vehicle. He was already cranky that his card got rejected. I didn't want to start another conflict with him. My next most logical option was to go to the pump itself and try and manually override it. And that's exactly what I did. My manager had taught me a few months ago how to put the pumps in admin mode. This would allow us to see if there was something physically wrong with the pump or it was just deciding not to work. But unfortunately, there was something seriously wrong with this pump. Something which I wouldn't be able to fix. This wasn't news I was excited to tell the man. But I knew I had to close this pump and eventually let him know that he'd have to move his car. But as I turned around to go inside, I heard a loud thud. I turned around and saw nothing. At first I thought it was something for my music. Keep in mind I have one airpod in this whole time. But that's when I heard another knock from the van. This couldn't be my music. The knocks were random, they had no beat or rhythm, and they clearly weren't any instrument I'd heard of. I tried to peep in the back windows to see what was happening in there, but the back windows were tinted very, very dark. I really couldn't see in there. I then took my AirPod out to get a better understanding of what was even happening, and heard another thud. This was getting weird. I had to understand what was going on in that damn van. I took out my phone and turned on my flashlight and I tried to use the flashlight to see better in through the tinted windows. Let's just say it worked, and what I saw horrified me. In the back of the car was a group of children. All of them were tied down with their mouths taped closed. All of them looked terrified. The knocking sound was coming from one of the kids kicking the car door as a sign for help. My heart sank. I didn't even know what to do for that second. I just stood there, frozen in fear and shock. In that paralyzed moment of fear, that's when it all started to hit me. The man's anger and impatience, his fraudulent card not going through, the way he looked at me and the car as he was going to the bathroom, I knew exactly what was happening at this moment. After my brain cleared up, I realized I had to stop standing there and quickly go and do something. As I turned around quickly to try and run for help, I bumped right into someone. It was the man. You know, it's not polite to snoop around people's stuff, kid. The man told me, rage and anger under his breath. At this point, both of us knew exactly what was happening. For some reason, I thought I could talk my way out of this. 
Um, y you know, w well, you see, I... But as I was trying to make up some sort of excuse, the man lunged at me. With all of the luck in the world, I managed to dodge him. Keep in mind that I'm a rather skinny young man. Thankfully, I had the agility advantage on my side, and I could somehow outmaneuver him. As the man was getting back on his feet, I managed to grab one of the windshield cleaning wands from the bucket nearby. Without even thinking, I managed to smack him across the face with it as hard as I could. This seemed to knock him out cold. I then quickly smashed open the car windows using the same rod and let the kids out. All of the kids and I ran inside the store. We locked the doors and called the cops. The man was gaining consciousness by the time the cops came, but was handcuffed soon after. I told the police everything, and they instantly had a case. The man was part of a larger kidnapping ring in my state. Off late, their newest strategy was to pretend to be chaperones and kidnap kids from sports games. A lot of these sports teams have transportation services which help bring the kids in and out, and these people managed to find a way of pretending to be them. The kids were all thankfully okay, and they were instantly reunited with their parents. But obviously, this left a bad stain on our community. A lot of parents stopped using carpools or paid transportation to bring their kids in and out of the games. Some even de-enrolled their children permanently. I couldn't help but imagine what could have happened to those kids if that pump didn't fail. If the terminal just accepted his money and he could drive off. Needless to say, I quit 7-Eleven right after that. I was being paid to use a cash register, not deal with kidnappers. It was a cool spring evening, and I was a little more than halfway through a road trip. For a bit of context, I'm a 23 year old man. I was starting my career as an aspiring actor and model at the time, and things were starting to pick up with my job. I was contacted by a well-known agency in Los Angeles, California, and they said they were willing to do a long-term contract with me and essentially were ready to start work. Obviously, I was thrilled, and while this was a dream come true, there was one issue. I lived in New York, and being a 23-year-old working an almost minimum wage job, I really couldn't afford to just hop on a flight and go over to LA. So when I got the news, I did the math, and I realized that it would actually be a lot cheaper to just drive from New York to California. Now obviously, if I had the money, I would obviously choose flying 6 hours over driving 40 in my dad's old Ford. But hey, money doesn't grow on trees, and I wasn't going to reject this opportunity. So there I was, about 24 hours into the trip. I had taken a rest somewhere in Kentucky, but was still quite tired. Sleeping in your car is never fun, especially after hours and hours of driving in it. A couple more hours went by and I caught myself in a rural part of West Texas. At this point, I noticed that my car was running a bit low on gas, and most importantly, the low air pressure light was on. My parents have had this car since I was a kid, so obviously I wasn't going to take the risk of just driving with the light on. After all, I wouldn't want to get stuck somewhere on the rural highway. According to the Maps app on my phone, the nearest gas station with an air pump was a local 7-Eleven, about 10 minutes off of my trip's path. It was late at night, 1am to be specific but thankfully 7-Elevens are open 24-7. As much as the detour annoyed me, I really didn't have much of a choice. I was honestly lucky that there was even anything open and nearby. I drove up to the 7-Eleven and pulled my car into the nearest pump. I popped open my gas cap and started filling my car, and after a few minutes, surely enough, it was full. But then came the next and arguably most important step, fixing that tire pressure light. While I was out of my car, I tried to look around and look at which tire was tripping off the sensor. But as I was looking around, I noticed a shadow from inside the store. It moved somewhat awkwardly. It seemed like one of the store workers was peering out the window, and they backed away instantly when they saw me look over. Well that's weird, I thought. Despite the clerk's social anxiety, I needed to get to my destination, and I didn't want to spend any more time here than I had to. So I went up to the air pump, and sadly enough, the air pump wasn't self-serve. This meant I had to go inside and talk to that nervous employee for help. Damn it. I walked in the door and looked around, but I didn't see any employees whatsoever. The store was barren, almost like it was up and running and suddenly abandoned. All of the lights were on and the equipment was functioning. The hum of the refrigerators and AC ironically made the silence even creepier. I figured that employee from before was somewhere in the back on his break so I tried to get his attention. Um, hello? Excuse me? There was a long and awkward pause, followed by a set of steps coming in from the back. Um, hello? Is anyone there? I asked once again. Another long and awkward pause followed, and then, 
eerie sounds of manic laughter. Um, excuse me? Is this some kind of joke? I asked, irritated from the antics. What was going on? Why was this employee acting like a kid? Come on over! Don't be shy! The man said, trying to lure me over to the back. Don't get me wrong. I was beyond creeped out and confused at this point, but I just wanted him to hit the damn power switch to the pump. I reluctantly walked over to the back to check what was happening. I figured if I just played into this guy's weird game, he'd just listen to me or leave me alone. So naturally, I reluctantly walked over to the back. There was nothing behind the counter, but there seemed to be a constant giggling from a door that said employees only. My back was tense, and pretty much every urge in my body told me not to open the door. But mistakenly, I did. When I opened that door, I saw something I'd never forget for the rest of my life. In the room, there was a 7-Eleven employee, still in his vest and uniform, mutilated on the ground. Behind the employee was the man giggling from before, still chuckling. He was barefoot, sickly looking, and had tattered, bloody clothing. He then looked at me with manic eyes and started laughing even harder. My feet were frozen, almost like they were cemented into the ground. But then, the man's laughter turned into full-on screaming, and he started crawling towards me. I quickly slammed the door and darted towards my car, but as I was running, I felt something tug my ankle and trip me from behind. Now don't leave so early, the man said, trying to drag me back. I kicked the man in the face as hard as I could and ran out. I quickly got into my car, locked the doors, and started the engine. As soon as I pulled out of the spot, the crazy man jumped on my hood and started screaming at me to stop the car. I didn't know what else to do, so I just floored it, and that seemed to throw the man off. I kept driving and never looked back, sweating and panting the whole time. Eventually, the tire that was low on air got me, and I had to pull over into another town. I immediately called the local law enforcement and told them everything that happened. When they showed up to the scene, they did not find a single thing. Aside from the dead 7-Eleven worker and raided store with broken glass and flipped over shelves, the police couldn't find anything that could lead them to the man. The police could obviously identify the dead employee, but had no idea who the laughing man was or where he could be. The man was a ghost. I've never told anyone this story. At least not until now, and that's probably for good reasons. I currently live in LA, and while I am still pursuing my career in entertainment, I still sometimes think about where that man could be. I live in a place called Dark Hollow, about 20 minutes outside of Pittsburgh. It's a really nice neighborhood, really leafy and green with some really nice old houses, and I won't deny that I've been immensely privileged to have grown up there. But at the same time, there was a huge downside to living there too, and that came in the form of the Ward family. The Wards were an absolute nightmare to live near to, and they made pretty much every other family's lives unbearable at some point for a variety of different reasons. Individually, they were bad enough, but collectively, they were like a horror movie level of nightmarish, like, I wouldn't be surprised if there was some budding horror filmmaker who writes or directs the next Hereditary and it all comes out that it was inspired by the wards. The patriarch of the family was named Winston, or Wynn for short, but being one of Wynn's neighbors was nothing short of a serious loss. Now, for reference, I had most of my encounters with Wynn when I was a teenager, and being a girl, Wynn always took a certain liking to me that he just didn't show to other people. He was always sickeningly polite with me, the kind of polite that verged on weirdly flirtatious. To other people, it probably just seemed like he was overly nice, maybe a little socially awkward. But being alone with Wynn or in situations where there weren't close observers, that was a different situation entirely. There were a handful of occasions where I caught Wynn looking at me in a way that made my skin crawl. He had a hunger in his eyes, like this beastly, ravenous look like he wanted to eat me alive. His eyes would glaze over and his lips would curl up ever so slightly in this horrifically perverted way that always made me feel stupidly uncomfortable. There was one time when I bumped into him in a convenience store near to downtown Pittsburgh. After he said hi and made a little small talk, he seemed to follow me around the store for a little while. 
He acted all innocent, making out like he was just browsing stuff in the aisles, but at some point, he got way too close to me. I think I was just too nervous to actually do anything about it. I didn't want to make a scene or cause any unnecessary conflict. After all, what would I tell people? Mr. Ward stood near me in a store. Anyways, when he was standing close to me, I heard him sniffing the air, like taking these big inhalations of breath through his nose, almost like he was trying to smell me. I couldn't walk away fast enough, and in the end, I left the store without even picking up what I went in there to buy. Like I said, he was overly nice to girls and women, but an absolute monster to any boys or men who happened to catch him in the wrong mood. He once ran out of the house with a baseball bat when my big brother used their driveway to turn around once, and the way he told it, if he hadn't driven away as fast as he could, Mr. Ward probably would have done some damage to his car. Then there was his wife, Maggie. Maggie always wore way too much makeup. I mean, so much it looked really jarring, and she plucked her eyebrows really, really thin. I'm pretty sure she was a good few years younger than Wynn, but... The way she made herself up made it seem like she was 20 or 30 years older and was just trying to look younger. Maggie was famous for sitting out on their porch and knitting, which I think contributed to the whole old person vibe she gave off. Only she didn't really ever seem to be knitting anything. I remember walking our dog around the neighborhood and getting a look at the tangled mess of yarn she just seemed to be poking needles into. It was like a lime green spider web just... A tangle of thread she stared at like she was in some kind of trance. She also had this talent for turning super happy sounding innocent nursery rhymes into the creepiest sounding things, singing them all slow and deliberate in a sing-song voice that sounded like a combination of a creaking door and nails on a chalkboard. I remember one time when we got some of their mail delivered to our house by mistake and my mom made me go over to drop it off. Mrs. Ward was sitting on their porch, poking these dirty-looking knitting needles into a tangle of yarn and singing. Ring around the rosy, a pocket full of posies, ashes, ashes, we all fall down. When she looked up to see me standing there with the mail in my hand, she acted all scared, which was nuts because I think I was way more freaked out to be over there but she thanked me for bringing the mail over anyway. Yet before I turned to leave, she asked me if I knew what nursery rhyme she was singing. I nodded, and she asked if I knew what the origins were. I said no. And she went on to explain to me that the song had its roots in some old plague that had swept across England. I think she meant the Black Death, but I can't be certain. She said the ring around the rosy part was a reference to a rash that was a symptom of the disease, and a posy was a collection of herbs that was carried to mask the scent of rot that the dying people were said to have given off. Then she tells me that the all fall down part was a reference to people dying from the plague. I don't know how true any of that is, but Jesus... It freaked me out to have her tell me that in her weird scratchy voice with her face all painted up like some circus clown. Their younger son Jacob Ward was a total freak. He was obsessed with Native American culture, which I'm not saying is a bad thing at all, but Jacob was totally toxic about it. It was rare that you'd see that kid and he didn't have his face painted or have this grim homemade headdress on or whatever. He also liked to run around with a bow and arrow that his parents insisted was totally harmless and used those cartoony sucker tip arrows. But there are a lot of people, myself included, that swear that they'd seen him using actual sharp tip arrows on a handful of occasions. He'd aim them at you, pull the drawstring back to the point that you'd actually run for cover, but he never seemed to fire any, and you could never catch him using them whenever there were any grown-ups around. They actually got a social worker called over at some point because a few people had seen Jacob walking around with dead squirrels or pigeons. I'm not sure if he'd shoot them himself with his bow and arrow or they were just roadkill or something, but it was alarmingly enough to enough people that they actually had a visit from someone. Although whether or not that actually came to anything, I don't know. Then finally, their older son was this kid named Johnny. Johnny was the kind of kid that growled at people in high school when they got too close to him. 
and before he got expelled for fighting, did something seriously messed up. Apparently he asked this girl to go out on a date, some super pretty but super nerdy girl who happened to be his lab partner. She says no, and Johnny doesn't take it very well at all. He made things difficult for her during chemistry by not talking or looking at her and eventually she had to basically beg the teacher to switch partners so she could even get a passing grade. Not long after, she was driving back from school in her seemingly empty car when she looks in the rearview mirror to see Johnny just sitting in her back seat, grinning at her. He'd apparently broken into her car and hidden in the footwell in her back seat under some blankets or something, or at least that's what we all figured he'd done. She was so scared she crashed her car and had to spend a week in the hospital. All Johnny got was a visit from the cops and a warning to stay away from her, and somehow it was all just blamed on teenage hijinks. I think maybe because the girl's family were too scared of the wards to press charges or whatever. I'm sure there's more to that story, but that's all I know of that. When the for sale sign finally showed up from the ward's house, I think Dark Hollow was about ready to throw a big party to celebrate them leaving, and after they did, they became something of an urban legend, basically a campfire tale that only a handful of people really knew was actually true and not something we made up to scare people. Like, I still think it's a miracle that there wasn't any bigger drama to happen involving the wards, something like a murder or whatever, little Jacob shooting someone with an actual arrow. I know Johnny basically almost killed his lab partner in that car crash, but, but somehow they never actually went through with seriously hurting anyone. But who knows, maybe a couple of more years and there would have been a fatality. And who knows what they've been up to, wherever they moved to. Maybe it's only a matter of time before they seriously hurt someone. Before I moved across the country for college, I lived with my mom in Fresno, California. I love her, and she always did her best for me and my sister with what little she had, but I think she'd be the first to admit that we live in a terrible neighborhood with little opportunity to improve our situation. But I guess that's just how life is when you're a teenage pregnancy with a father who just disappeared in the thin air. But growing up, I always thought my mom was kind of terrible. She rarely let us play outside, wouldn't ever let us go to the store on our own. She acted like an all-around control freak whose goal was to make our lives as boring and uneventful as possible. Later in life, we had a major heart-to-heart -heart where she leveled with me about why she was so strict with us when we were growing up. After that, I understood why she was the way she was. The family next door were heavily involved in meth and gang activity but they weren't just partying and dealing out of the family home. They were a group of seriously sadistic psychopaths who did things to the local community that could pretty fairly be described as pure evil. They got raided by the cops in the end, but not before they'd done some pretty irreparable damage to the neighborhood. And my mom opened up by telling me about one particular incident that had been the catalyst for her being so strict with us. Apparently... They used a little recruitment tactic on more than one occasion, one that involved inviting a young girl over to party before forcing her to smoke meth. They'd keep her there for days, just feeding her meth and loaning her out to partygoers. That's the least obscene way I can phrase it, but you get the idea. Then they'd threaten to tell her parents or tell the call of cops on her, some kind of blackmail method to keep them coming back and bringing their friends and siblings, etc., from what I understand, it was kind of a vicious cycle of like brainwashing girls which in turn attracted more guys which then allowed them to sell considerably more meth since lewd activity was involved. My mom also said that more than once she saw two guys carrying unconscious people out to a car, throwing them in the back seat then driving them away, and that on a couple of occasions she saw missing posters for these people tacked up around the neighborhood. I asked her why she didn't go to the cops about the family and she actually broke down crying. She said she was constantly terrified and had multiple encounters with the family members next door who told her that if the cops ever showed up, they'd make sure that she suffered. 
She told me that they once warned her that they were heavily armed, had all kinds of automatic weapons inside their place, and that if the cops ever came, they'd rather all die in a shootout than be taken alive. Apparently they laughed about how they had guns so powerful that they'd rip through the neighborhood and that our family would probably die in the crossfire or something. That was something that absolutely terrified her. We were all she had in the world, and she wanted to protect us at all costs, so the idea of us losing our lives to some horrific drug-fueled shootout, it was unimaginable. My mom was a quarter Mexican too, and she knew a few things about something called Santa Muerte, a kind of pagan figure that some Mexican people worship as like a personification of death. She said she could sometimes hear people in the backyard of the meth house invoking her name, possibly even making sacrifices since she heard chickens squawking and goats bleeding. And according to her, a lot of people who worshipped Santa Muerte were connected with Mexican cartels and were not to be messed with. She didn't want to take the chance. It took her years before she was able to afford to move and by that time I was a sophomore. But I can't even describe the relief I felt when I heard she was moving away from Fresno with my little sister. For the first time in years I was actually excited about going home to visit. We were finally away from that psycho family of meth addicted death worshippers. For the longest time, me and my family lived next door to these absolute insane people that made our lives a complete living hell for like an entire year. They were pretty well behaved for the first few months after they moved in, but after a while, they started absolutely blasting music in the middle of the night. I'm not just talking about that gentle kind of bass thump that passively is annoying. I'm talking the kind of loud where you couldn't get a wink of sleep. The police had to be called out a few times to get them to turn it down, and even then, they confessed that they couldn't really do anything other than issue fines. They got progressively worse though, and it turned out half the reason the music was so loud was to mask the sounds of the mom and dad having these legit fist fights in the middle of the night. It wasn't even a case of it being a one-sided domestic abuse either. The dad sometimes had worse black eyes than the mom, and scratches all down his face where she'd obviously clawed him to death. They used to knock the seven shades out of each other, but we didn't think they were too dangerous to anyone outside their own family. Once or twice my dad had gotten into confrontations with them about the smell coming from their backyard, or the fact that they used to blast music. The dad of this insane family had threatened to kill my dad once or twice, but none of us thought that he would actually go through with it, and thank God they didn't. Then for some reason it went really quiet over there for a few weeks, and it got to the point we thought that it actually moved. Only they hadn't moved at all. They were just keeping their heads down because they'd straight up killed their own daughter. Apparently she tried to run away from home and ended up in a shelter somewhere. They tracked her down, dragged her into their car one night, taken her somewhere secluded and then beat her to death. I'm not sure they even meant to kill her. They just beat her up so bad that she ended up dying not long after that. That's why they'd been so quiet. They didn't want to bring down any attention on themselves when they were dealing with disposing of her body. We had police basically camped out on our street for like a week after they'd been arrested. All kinds of forensic vans with people in those full body white fabric suits going in and out all hours of the day. They were obviously looking for traces of the girl but whether or not they found anything I'm not really sure. I do know it was in the paper though and like I said, I thank God the guy never did anything to my dad because he did actually go on to murder someone, his own daughter at that. I feel like every neighborhood has a family of absolute psychos. Almost everyone I've spoken to about this sort of thing seems to remember one group of absolute wrongins, be it from their childhoods or from their current lives. 
and if there's one thing I've learned from their collective memories and stories, it's that whenever there's a family like that around, it's only a matter of time before something comes to a head, or something finally boils over. And that's exactly what happened with this insane family that lived in my neighborhood when I was a kid. Only the thing is, most of the people I've spoken to said the breaking point came when some kind of family argument or confrontation with neighbors spilled out into the streets outside. Police were called, arrests were made, usually a for sale sign or two went up in the aftermath. But I almost wish my story was that simple, or ended that relatively amicably, because what happened in my case is something that haunts me to this day with possibilities and ramifications that I find genuinely terrifying. I grew up in the 70s Britain, in a pretty small town in a place called Wiltshire. We were quite a small community, everyone knew everyone and consequently, everyone knew everyone's business too. There was this one boy called Lewis and he was the only child of the prestige family. A very peculiar family name if ever there was one but that's not the reason I'll never forget it. The Prestige family were peculiar by name and peculiar by nature too. But then peculiar seems like entirely the wrong word to use. Peculiar makes you think of something quaint and adorably abnormal, but there was nothing adorable about the Prestige family. They were just weird, scarily weird too, and mean. I think one of the earliest memories of Lewis is during an assembly in primary school. It's about 8 in the morning and all the kids in school are sat in the main hall and it's deathly quiet apart from our headmaster making announcements and the soft sobs of young Lewis. He didn't stop crying for the whole of the assembly and they didn't just remain this quiet weeping either. His tears built in pitch and intensity until he was wailing so loud that a teacher had to remove him altogether. I remember feeling really sorry for him but as time went on it was just something you sort of got used to. They were the weird family in town and since they didn't get into any serious confrontations outside of their own family unit, people just sort of let them be. The next serious incident I remember was years later in secondary school, when the schoolyard suddenly became abuzz with people gossiping over something. People were crowding around the school gates, looking at something, some of them laughing, some of them just gopping at the sight of a lad dressed entirely in a school uniform except for one crucial piece of it, his trousers. And it turned out to be Lewis. From what I heard, he had been basically pushed out of the car by who we assumed to be his dad, and rumors went flying around that Lewis hadn't quite been ready to leave the house when his dad was ready to take him to school that morning. Instead of waiting for him to put his school trousers on, Lewis's dad had just dragged him to the car and taken him to the school with no pants on, basically to teach him a lesson to be ready on time. I'm not entirely sure how true that reasoning was, but I do know that I witnessed Lewis having to walk into school in nothing but a school jumper, his shoes, and his underwear with my own eyes. I'm also not entirely sure how Lewis was still allowed to live with his evidently abusive parents either. Again, Rumors went around that they'd had a visit from social workers, but this I believe because, for a while, there seemed to be little in the way of serious incidents coming from the Prestige household. Obviously, the visit from Child Welfare Services has been enough to shake them up into changing their ways, or so it seemed. Now, this all came to a head when I was 15, maybe just over a year before we left secondary school and bid farewell to compulsory education for good. One morning, Lewis turns up to school in his own clothes, a pair of pumps and a colorful jumper. He gets pulled aside by a teacher who, I think at that point, was well aware of the situation at home, and Lewis says something quietly to him before the pair of them disappear into the building which housed the main office. The next thing I know is that, apart from the shoes he was wearing, Lewis has an entirely new school uniform. New blazer, new tie, new jumper everything. And from that day on, he seemed like almost an entirely new person. He didn't get dropped off at school by his parents anymore. He seemed more confident and open, more talkative with the other kids. He even started playing football with us at lunchtimes, something he'd never done before. 
We actually got quite pally with him for a while and on more than one occasion he invited us back home with him to play. We politely declined of course, thinking of some made up excuse not to have to go around the prestige house but still, things seemed to be making a vast improvement. Emphasis on seemed though because after a long bank holiday weekend, Lewis failed to turn up to school at all. This didn't have anyone talking about it too much. Kids were routinely off on the odd one or two days with illness, but Lewis went an entire week without showing up for school and that really did get us talking. I don't know if it was because I was so young and naive or I just didn't connect the dots, but I didn't think that there was any link between all the police activity around our town and Lewis not being in school. One Saturday afternoon, my mom and dad called me into the kitchen and asked me if I had been around to Lewis's house at all recently. I told them no, but that I'd been invited at one point and when I said that, my mom gave my dad this look that seemed to be a weird mix of horror and relief, like I'd dodged a bullet or something. Not long after that, I got word through some friends of mine that there had been a brutal double murder in the town, that someone had been arrested for it too. Our little town barely had any crime at all. I think the most serious thing to happen for decades at that point was a car theft committed by some out-of-towner. So the idea that there had been a single murder, let alone two, just set the town alight. And there was much speculation over the who the killer was and how the killings had come about. Looking back now, I can see why the adults might want to shield us from the whole thing. And it was only a few years later that I actually realized why the police had made such an effort to keep the identity of the murderer a secret. It's like that when a murderer is under the age of 18. When they're a minor, their identity is kept secret for as long as is able. And that's only really possible with the media because it didn't take long before the residents of our town figured out what had happened. And it was bound to trickle down to us sooner or later. The reason Lewis's parents didn't seem to be around anymore, the reason he was so happy and confident and carefree, was because he had killed them. He'd finally rid himself of the people that made his life torture. I get that. But the fact that a kid killing their own parents could make them so happy, that's something I've never been able to truly understand. The horrible thing was looking back on the events later and sort of piecing together the puzzle. For example, the day he came to school in his own clothes was probably the morning he'd killed them. And since he'd gotten blood on his school uniform, he had to dispose of it. All the times he'd invited us back to his place to watch TV or play football, his parents would have been dead in the upstairs bedroom, assuming that's where he'd killed them. If we'd gone round... Maybe we would have been able to smell them, or see flies buzzing around the bedroom door or something. We were all just one little spur of the moment, yes, from finding out, finding their bodies. Maybe if that was the case, then Lewis would have killed us, too. This happened a few weeks ago. I was hanging out with my friend Dustin and we decided to go explore this creepy old abandoned asylum. It was a huge building, about three stories high. We walked past the railroad. We then continued to the old asylum. As we walked to it, I looked up and my heart dropped. From the third story window, I could see someone looking down at me and Justin. I stopped and he asked me what was wrong. I told him to look up in that window on the right. He looked up and saw it too. We continued to stare at it for about a few seconds before whoever or whatever it was moved out of sight. We then were deciding if we should still go in. We settled it. It was just some person trying to buy drugs or something. Drug deals and teens were always in there sneaking. We went past no trespassing signs and explored the first level of the building. There was a lot of broken glass and graffiti everywhere. There was this one that said, I love it when they run. Don't get me wrong, that was kind of creepy, but obviously done as a joke. So we made it up to the second floor and basically the same thing there, except for an old elevator shaft that was cracked slightly open. Dustin turned his flashlight on and put it in the elevator. We saw a whole lot of electrical junk, some dead birds and animals. If that wasn't freaky enough, 
We also heard something walking above us on the third story. My heart felt like it was about to explode. I had a bad feeling about this, and I told him we should leave. He said, nah, it'll be fine, and he started walking up to the third story. I didn't want to be left alone near the spooky elevator, so I followed behind him. We had our phones out, taking pictures of all kinds of stuff on the previous floors. As we walked up the stairs, I swear we were being followed, and I told Dustin to hurry up. He went upstairs, and I wasn't far behind. What I saw on the third floor of that asylum will haunt me for the rest of my life. There were pentagrams and animals all over the place. It smelled awful up there. There were some rooms in the back of the corner. Keep in mind, this is the floor we saw that thing looking down at us from. We heard what sounded like whispers coming from the middle room. We got our phones out and started taking pictures of it. After I got about two or three pics, I saw a figure step out of the room. My heart was beating so hard I swear it had come through my chest. It was the same person I was looking from the window. Me and Dustin were freaking out, but we didn't dare move. About 10 seconds of staring, and it started sprinting at us screaming. I took off in a sprint down the stairs, almost dropping my phone. I ran and jumped out of the two-story window and landed in some brush. I got up and ran some more before crouching behind some old shed. Then it hit me. Dustin was still in there. I hadn't even noticed him when I ran down the stairs. I texted him and asked him where he was, but didn't reply. I sat crouched behind that shed for about three minutes before I saw Justin sprinting out of that house. I jumped from behind the shed and called his name. He saw me and screamed, run. He looked behind him. Then I looked behind him. He was being chased by two people. I took off down the road, heading for the railroad. Dustin caught up with me, and we didn't stop until we made it to the tracks. We jumped in a ditch beside the railroad and looked up to see the two people standing at the door of the asylum. They were watching us, but then turned and walked back inside. We ran up to the local burger place and sat down at a booth. Out of breath, we ordered some Sprite and fries. While waiting for food, I asked him what happened after I ran. He said the guy chased him and he ran down the stairs and saw me jump out of the window and he ran to the elevator where he found a small space behind some boxes to hide behind. He said after he sat there for a bit, the guy came down the stairs with another person. They were watching to see where we went. Then his phone went off because I texted him. He said they looked his direction and saw him. They then chased him down the stairs and out the door. And that's when I saw him and we ran. We didn't call the cops because we didn't want to get in trouble for trespassing. I don't know those guys, and I don't know what they were doing in that building, but needless to say, I don't think me or Dustin will ever go back there. This all happened 15 years ago. I was about 19 years old when I was offered a job by my cousin to work for her uncle's glass business. They install giant glass windows into tall buildings and skyscrapers. Not that it's too relevant to the story, but I thought it was worth mentioning. The catch to the job was that I had to temporarily move to Destin, Florida from Tampa. My cousin lived in Russellville, Alabama. And I really wanted to go visit the family there and leave with them together to go back down to Destin. Now, this was my first long distance road trip, and my very first trip away from my immediate family. Back then, I was driving a green Mercury Sable, a car barely capable of getting groceries back home. But in my invincible youth, I didn't really care about that. I was just so pumped to be spreading my wings and getting out into the real world that the risks didn't really concern me. My mom and dad had tried to get me to plan and pack better, knowing the trip could have its pitfalls. But I mean, it wasn't like the trip was going to last days. And also, fast food exists, so I wasn't really stressing out about that. I mean, I'm not stupid. I packed for the trip, and I'm going to be staying there for a few months in Destin. But they were really adamant on me bringing food, water, emergency supplies, etc. I declined because it wasn't the 1930s. And of course, there's gas stations at every exit, and I had a Razor flip phone. My way of thinking was, what could possibly happen on two busy interstates? It wasn't like I was going to some far off country with no cell service. Anyways, fast forward to the trip. I'm a Florida boy, so I had no idea Alabama could get so cold, and I also had no idea that the heat was broken in my car. I had never really used it. At first I'm thankful because by the time I reach Alabama, I'm tired as hell, 
and I had made a lot more stops than I anticipated. I still had a few hours to go, and the cold air was keeping me wide awake. Finally, I pull off the interstate and I start heading through these smaller numbered roads. The roads didn't really have conventional names like in Florida. They were just numbered, which I kind of found odd. After driving on those a bit, I started being sent down gravel roads. This was the days of MapQuest, so I didn't have a GPS guiding me through the just paved roads or rerouting me around roadblocks. I was starting to get really hungry and I thought back to my parents telling me to pack food. I really should have listened. The sketchiest thing with MapQuest was that you just printed out the directions, so you didn't really have a map to fall back on. So going out of your way to find fast food at an exit came with the potential of legitimately getting lost. So I had basically passed a few times to turn off for food because I was tired and I just didn't want to chance it. Instead, however, I was looking for something off the side of the road that I could easily pull in and then back out with no fuss. But more importantly, no risk of getting lost. My prayers were answered a little down the road when I saw a beat up old country grocery store on my right hand side. It didn't even have a name, it just said grocery right across the front of the white building. I pulled in because the light shining across the grocery sign was on, but found it odd that most of the lights inside were off. I'm not gonna lie, this gave me the creeps a little, but it didn't stop me from going up to the door. I was really starving and maybe this was a 24 hour place but I wasn't sure. I saw a shadow move across the back of the long aisles as I approached the glass door and surprisingly opened it with ease. At this point, I was honestly half expecting them to be closed due to the lack of lighting inside, and I was really hoping that the owner would take pity on a tired traveler and let me grab some snacks. I then called out, Hello? Anyone here? No one answered. I then said something along the lines of, I saw you when I pulled up, and I was hoping you're still open. Again, no answer. Now, this was really naive of me, but I assumed that maybe the owner was just older or something and maybe he couldn't hear me, or that maybe he was deaf, so I went further back into the store. It honestly didn't really smell that great inside there, and I had hoped that they had at least had some chips or something. At least those are sealed. Suddenly, a man emerged from the back. Oh, I'm so sorry. We were just about to close. How can I help you? He asked with a smile. He clearly made me jump out of my skin at first, but he seemed friendly enough. Not the old man I was picturing before, but actually a much younger guy. Maybe in his 30s. Yeah, I just came up from Florida. It's been a long drive. I was kind of hoping you guys had something to eat for the trip. Oh, we have plenty. What are you looking for exactly? He said without taking his eyes off me. The guy had a really weird unblinking stare that just really put me on edge. But what made me the most uncomfortable was his smile. He smiled big but his eyes never moved. As in the only way you could tell he was conveying an emotion was by looking at his mouth. The rest of his face stayed the same. Most people you could tell they're smiling even if their mouth was covered. Because you smile with your whole face. But not this guy. Yeah, I just wanted some chips, maybe a Coke. Do you have any Doritos? Of course, he said, walking past me. He locked the door behind me before turning and smiling. I don't want anyone else walking in, he chuckled. Him locking the door was really creepy, but I just shrugged it off because the reasoning was pretty sound, even though it felt off. Follow me, the guy said as he walked towards the back of the store. I was young, but I really should have been smart enough to know that the store owners generally don't give customers a tour of the store, but I had lived a pretty sheltered life. I could feel that something was off, but I didn't want to offend him by asking questions like, what's that smell, and other things. We get to the back of the store to where those plastic flaps hang that separate the customer side and the back end. When the man sticks his hand through, parting through the plastic, then saying, right this way. Now alarm bells are starting to go off in my head, especially as he starts looking around and past me like someone who's selling drugs and trying to watch out for the police. Uh, back there? I ask and start to back up a little. That's when I then notice chips right beside me on the aisle. The guy noticed me see the chips and then says, Yeah, back here. 
We got all our good stuff in the back. You can come take your pick. By this time, I had found the source of the buzzing. Flies are flying over the meat section, and the dim light that's reflecting off the packaging lets me know that it's been sitting there a while. I'll just take this if that's alright. I say nervously as I grab a bag off the shelf next to me, and then start backing up towards the door. Trust me, those are no good. I have way better stuff back here. He smiles again, gesturing for me to head back. I fake pat my pockets, then saying, Oh man, I think I forgot my wallet in my car. I'll be right back. As soon as the words left my lips, I then spun around and did a light jog to the front, increasing with speed as I approached the door. I make it to the door and twist the lock a couple times until I hear the click. I push the door open and turn back to look at where the man is, but he's gone. I jumped into that car and sped the fuck out of that parking lot and didn't stop again until I reached my cousin's house. This was by far one of the eeriest and creepiest things that have ever happened to me. This happened when I was seven years old with my twin sister and mother. We had just entered our local grocery store, Surefine, when a man no more than 10 feet in front of us glanced over and immediately whipped his head back towards us. Now as a quick side note, my twin and I at that age were always dressed in matching dresses, and we had long blonde hair that had always got us looks of alls and affection, but this was different. He was a bulky middle-aged man of mid-eastern descent, and it stopped what he was doing to fully look at us up and down. A really husky smile crossed his scruffy face. My mother paid no mind to this, as she was no stranger to creepy men herself. I immediately grumbled to my twin Cass how creepy it was the way the man was looking at us. So as we turned left to start going through the aisles, Cass and I turned and we saw the man walking toward us with his shopping cart. When we first made eye contact, he immediately turned his attention to a table with baked goods on it which kind of stood out to Cass and I more than if he had just kept walking normally. So, my mother's obviously shopping and Cass and I just keep glancing back and we keep catching the man at the end of every aisle that we enter, just staring with no expression on his face, and even from a slight distance, he was seemingly breathing like really weirdly. I also noticed that his cart continues to remain empty, except for the baked goods that he grabbed when we had first looked back at him. We tell my mother, but she just rolls her eyes at us and tells us that he probably thinks we're following him because we keep looking at him. The man disappears as we hit the last of the aisles, and Cass and I are already on a completely different topic by now, when we're heading for the registers, having almost completely forgotten about him within minutes. We're about to make it to the register when my sister asks my mom for a candy bar, and I quickly join to which she then angrily replies that we don't have the money for it. We're both pouting at this point and she threatens to leave us as she begins putting things on the conveyor belt. But then Cass and I watch my mother turn to face us again when her expression completely changes and her eyes shift behind us. It's the man. He's sweating profusely at this point and he's literally less than like a foot behind us. Cass and I immediately take a step forward towards our mother. The man laughs awkwardly then apologizes, saying, Sorry ma'am. I didn't mean to scare you girls. You're all just so beautiful. These girls, are they yours? My mother kind of scoffs to this and then goes, Yeah, they're mine. And he does that same awkward laugh again, then saying, I couldn't help but notice that you don't have the money to get them what they want. How old are they, and you as well? I could help you. I have lots of money. Money's no problem for me. My mother's face then furrows in confusion and annoyance, then snapping. Um, excuse me? Like clockwork, he laughs again like it's some big joke, then says, I'm serious, how much? My mother stares at him blankly for a moment, and he continues, How much for the girls? I'd like both of them, but if you can only part with one, I could still make that work. I'll give you the money. Just name your price, and I can give them anything they want. Any candy they want. He grins yet again and wipes his brow, looking down at us. My mother doesn't respond to him, just looks at us and growls, Here, now. So we do as we were told, which was fine by us because we didn't want to be anywhere near this creepy man. 
The cashier was a teenage girl no older than 17, and she was just completely wide-eyed watching this conversation occur as she silently continues to scan our groceries. Once we were next to my mother, she then growls at the man. If you so much as lay one fucking finger on my kids, I'll break it off and shove it down your throat. Which were some pretty big words coming from my 4 foot 11 mother. But the man's face darkens, and without even purchasing anything, he walks around the cash register and exits, but he doesn't get far. The entire front of the store is glass, so moments later we watch as he presses his face against the glass trying to see in, leaving a sweaty face print behind. Now, at this point, the cashier's alerting her manager and asking him to call the police. My mother immediately assures them that that's not necessary and just asks the manager to walk us out to her car. We see no sign of the man as we unload our groceries and hop into the car. My mother quickly drives us home once we sit in the car for a few minutes, scanning for any signs that he might be waiting in a car or something. We eventually made it home safely and nothing ever came of it. I don't know what happened to the man, but I truly hope he never convinced anyone to give him their kid. That's absolutely horrific to think about. This happened about four years ago. I was 20 years old at the time. The first time I met the guy who had become my grocery store stalker, he was standing outside the store collecting money for the Salvation Army's Christmas time donations. I'm a fairly friendly person, so I like to say hi to people who work at places I frequent just to be nice. This guy was a kid around my age, very tall, with a mild resemblance to Lurch from the Adams family. Dark circles under dark eyes, short black hair, and a kind of vacant look in his eyes. I chatted with him for maybe about two minutes, kind of just idle chit-chat about the weather and whatnot. Nothing particularly memorable or interesting. I then waved goodbye and went home. Little did I know that that single moment would be the start of something that would have me genuinely afraid. About four or five months passed and I hadn't seen him again. Then one day as I was grocery shopping with a friend when, as we were chatting, she suddenly got really quiet and kind of recoiled backwards, then looking behind me. I turned around to see this guy who had to be at least six foot four towering over me, not eight inches from my body. He said hi and he told me that he remembered from that December that I had talked to him and then asked for my number. I, being young and had never really experienced this type of interaction before, told him that I didn't have my number memorized but that I would write his down and then maybe text him later. I kind of half waved my phone at him pointing at my at the time boyfriend whose picture was my wallpaper, making a point to say, oh look, that's my boyfriend, to the guy hoping he would clue in, but no luck. He told me his number which immediately upon getting I blocked without letting him get my number. However, what really made my blood run cold was what he said to me after I put my phone away. He leaned in real close to me and in a really low voice then told me, Whatever I text you is for your eyes only. I start to feel genuinely uncomfortable at this point. I said back, Uh, yeah, sure. It was nice talking to you but we gotta get back to shopping. And I grabbed my friend and dragged her off, shooting a panicked look at her and asking her why she didn't bail me out. Apparently he scared her too with him getting so close to me and she just didn't know what to do. I also want to make it clear that I'm not exactly a small girl. I'm 5 foot 8 and solidly built. I can certainly handle myself and I very rarely ever feel intimidated or small in the presence of anyone, male or female. But this guy, he really made me feel tiny and scared. In the months that would follow, he would make me feel truly frightened. I had really hoped that that creepy interaction would be the last time I saw him, but unfortunately that wasn't the case. After that initial meeting with him saying that creepy thing about his text being for my eyes only, it seemed like I would run into him every single time that I got into the store. No matter what checkout lane I was in, he always seemed to appear at the end of it when I was finished shopping, and every time I was in the store, I would always notice him out of the corner of my eye watching me, no matter what area I was in. One time I even caught him following me out to my car. At that point I got scared and I finally decided to say something to the managers. After letting all the managers know what was going on, they then assured me that they would tell him not to talk to me. After that he wouldn't speak to me but I would continue to see him following me around the store at a distance every single time I went up there. It got so bad and I felt so terrified that I started to be afraid to go to the store at all. 
but I'm one of those stubborn people who refuses to be intimidated by someone to the point where I'll stop doing something. I had really hoped that maybe it was just a coincidence that he was following me. After all, it was a really big store, and maybe he just had things to do that just happened to be in the same area as I was shopping in, so I started to pay close attention to my surroundings. Once I started really paying attention, I realized that every single time I was up there, I would constantly notice him in the same areas in the store that I was in. During my last encounter with him, I had went to the store to just grab two or three items that I needed for dinner that night, and I first saw him standing at the store when I got there, and with his bag facing me, I quickly ran inside, hoping he didn't see me. Unfortunately, a few minutes later, I had saw him at the very back of the store, and items in hand, I immediately made a beeline towards the front. As soon as I got near the checkout, I ducked behind one of the shelf displays and watched carefully at the front of the store to see if the creepy guy would appear. I watched as he looked up and down at the checkout, and when he didn't see me there, I saw him step outside. At this point, I quickly ran to the nearest open cashier, rang up all my items, and then stuck my head out the door to look for him. I didn't see him there immediately, so I started trying to make my way back to where I was parked. I had parked a little ways away near the side of the store where a bunch of other small stores and restaurants were lined up at, and I was walking towards my car. I realized then that I saw him standing by the entrance that I had first entered the store through, and then dug behind a pillar immediately, hoping he didn't see me. I watched carefully from behind the pillar, and as he scanned the parking lot, he obviously couldn't find me. After a minute or two, he started to walk out towards the direction of the parking lot in front of the store, and so I took that opportunity to make a run for it to my car as soon as that he was far enough away that I felt safe. As soon as I got into my car, I then locked the doors, and to my horror when I looked up, he was standing there about 15 feet from my car with a shopping cart in front of him. I knew that he followed me, and he knew that I knew. I fully believed that he had chased after me, and when I made it to my car, he grabbed the nearest cart to make it look like he was collecting them from the parking lot. I remember just feeling absolutely terrified at that moment. I went home and I immediately told my grandfather what had just happened. I began crying and shaking and my grandfather told me to get in the car. Well, we're going to settle this. He and I drove up to the store in his car and he walked me into the store and demanded we spoke with the managers immediately, both of them. When the managers arrived at customer service, he asked me to tell them what had been happening and demanded that they ensure he left me alone or that he would involve the police. The manager swore up and down they would take care of it. As far as I know, he wasn't fired immediately because my friend who first encountered him with me when this whole thing began told me that she would see him from time to time when she was there by herself, but that any time I went with her, she would never see him. I fully believed that he knew whenever I was there, only this time instead of stalking me, he avoided me. Eventually, everyone who knew the situation stopped seeing him there, so I think he may have gotten fired or moved on from that store. Either way, I haven't had any issues since, but I've never in my life felt so afraid of another human being as I did that day, seeing him make eye contact with me in the parking lot as I locked my car doors. It still really creeps me out to think that he was watching me so closely every time I entered the store that he could so easily avoid or follow me whenever he wanted. So yeah... I was stalked every time I went grocery shopping for four months straight, and I never want to experience that ever again. I worked as a Walmart cashier for a little over a year. I quit in August of 2015 when I went away to college. As a cashier, you see a lot of people in a day, especially at Walmart, and after a while you don't even see people's faces when you look at them but there are some people that you see so often you start to recognize and sometimes learn their names. There was this one guy, always in the same Green Bay Packers hoodie and Chicago Cubs baseball cap, that would often seek out my line no matter how long it was just so he could stare at me and rarely say a word. Whenever he did say anything to me, he would always lean across the register to get closer to my face. He always gave me a really bad vibe. But when I asked other cashiers about him, they said that he had never been weird around them. One of the girls even said he was a close family friend. After that, I dropped the issue. One night after I'd been there for about a year, I was working a 2 to 11 shift. Those shifts were always the worst because you'd be there for three, sometimes four front end managers, but also because it takes the chunk out of your day when you were actually going to do anything. 
so I'm down on the self-checkout. It's about 10.15, so I'm counting the minutes until I can shut it down at 10 to 11. The creepy guy comes in the front door and makes a beeline for me at the self-check podium. When I see him come in, I instantly get nervous. He walks up and says, Can I still buy a cell phone card and electronics? I told him I only worked as a cashier on the front end, so I didn't know anything about electronics, but he could go back and check. He seemed peeved by this answer, but he walked away without another word. About ten minutes later, he comes up with a prepaid phone card and said there's no one at the register in electronics, so I activate his card and hand it to him, telling him to have a good night, but he pushes the card back at me without saying a word, and I say, Is something wrong? To which he replies, These minutes aren't on my phone yet, are they? I was confused by this statement because, of course they weren't, he had just bought the card. I shook my head, and he waved the card in front of my face. Why the fuck are you just standing there? Reactivate my phone! When he talked, he was so close I could smell his breath, and I was a little scared. I wanted to put in the call to my manager so that someone could come down and help me. This is where I should probably mention that I'm about 5 foot 3, and he is closer to probably 6 foot 5, and very stocky, so he was towering over me, and the thought that he could easily overpower me crossed my mind, but I get so nervous whenever men yell or cuss at me because my dad was never the type to yell or cuss. I took the card out of his hand and he slammed his cell phone on the scanner. I was trying not to let him know I was nervous, but I was terrified. I knew I had never put minutes on a prepaid phone before, but I don't dare tell him that in fear of what he might do. So I read the directions, pick up his phone, dial the number, and as I'm putting in the card number, his phone runs out of minutes. I try to call back and get an error message. I'm at a loss. I meekly hand him his phone back and say, I'm sorry, something went wrong. I don't know what is happening. As soon as I say it, he takes his phone, opens it up, tries to dial someone, and when it doesn't work, he looks at me with furious eyes. He screams, What the fuck did you do to my phone? What the fuck? His voice is echoing in the store, and unfortunately we haven't gotten the end of second shift rush yet, so there is no one around. He closes his phone and opens it again, trying to make another call, but when it doesn't work, he throws the phone down on the scanner again. He says, I don't know what you did with my phone, but you better fucking fix it. But this comes much more quietly, practically a whisper. At this point, I'm worried he's going to put his hands on me, and I don't know what to do. I put in a call for a manager from my register, and then I say, I've called someone that might be able to help, but we're at shift change right now so it might be faster for you to take it to the customer service desk. He picks up his phone off the podium, still mumbling under his breath that I fucked up his phone, and I'm hoping I can get out of there before he comes back or at least have someone else down at the self-check with me. Another 15 minutes go by and I don't see him again. As I'm picking up items that people left by the registers, getting ready to shut them down for the night, he comes back and stands by the podium. He still looks completely pissed off and my stomach has sank. He made that finger motion that means come here without saying anything and for some reason that makes me even more nervous. When I'm standing in front of him, he leans so close to my face that I think he's about to kiss me or bite me or God knows what. I try to take a step back but he takes a step forward when I do. A creepy grin comes across his face as he says, the girl up there fixed it. Simple fix. But next time, I expect you to know what to do. Understand? I nod because I don't think I can speak. He gets impossibly closer before saying, I'm sorry I raised my voice. I never should have done that. Especially to a pretty girl like you. When he adds the last part, he lightly uses his fingertips to brush my bangs to the side. I took a step back and he said, Let me make it up to you. Let me buy you a drink. I shake my head, I say. No thank you, I'm only 19. He says, So we'll get a couple of beers and go back to my place. Again, I shake my head. No, it's really okay. I'm not much of a drinker. I have an early morning tomorrow. 
He looks displeased with this answer and says, Tell you what, I'll wait over here by the door just in case you change your mind. I smile at him weakly and tell him to have a good night. When I see him walk through the security, I quickly shut down the registers and sign out of mine. Then I run over to find a manager to tell about the whole thing. The third shift manager that I tell looks at me like I'm lying, and when I'm finished says, I know Todd, he wouldn't hurt a fly, he doesn't have it in him, you're probably just being dramatic. She then turns to another older cashier behind her, shakes her head and mumbles, teenagers. I ask if I can have someone to walk me to my car, and they tell me that management is in a meeting and the security guy went home already. So I clocked out and went to the bathroom. I waited in the bathroom for about 10 minutes before coming out and attempting to go to my car. When I walked around the corner through the security things, he wasn't sitting on the bench right there like I had been expecting. I relaxed a little before I realized he was standing just outside the door, far enough away to keep it from closing, smoking a cigarette. He has his back turned toward the door. Luckily, I never went out the front door so I always went to the corridor and not the side door. I quietly closed the door behind me so maybe I wouldn't catch his attention. I rushed to my car which was fortunately very close to the building. As I'm quick walking to my car, I hear him shout, Hey! Why are you avoiding me? Come here. At this point, I take off into a full-on sprint, which is not easy because I'm wearing Sperry's, so it's like running in clogs. I get to my car, get in, lock my door as I'm starting it, and don't even bother with my seatbelt. By that point, he had made it almost all the way to my car and was still yelling, telling me he just wanted to talk. I took off as fast as I could and took the longest way home with the most turns and twists that I could. When I got home, I told my dad about the experience and he was so angry that no one had answered my calls or believed me he called the store manager the next day and complained. I was never contacted about his complaint, but from that night on, whenever I saw that guy I would run to the bathroom or if I couldn't get away, I would put out my lane close sign and turn off my light so he couldn't get in my line. And you always hear people talking about the people of Walmart as being trashy, but they never tell you about the select few that are scary as hell. I'm a 23 year old male. I used to work for Airbnb as one of their contracted employees as their tier 1 customer service. For those that don't know, Airbnb is a hospitality service where every day people can rent out their homes and apartments either partially or entirely to people as an alternative to renting a hotel. It's a rather nice idea, although it's in a legal gray area because while there are no laws preventing it, there are no laws guaranteeing your rights as a tenant either, as there is with signing a lease or a home mortgage would grant you. If your host decides to cancel your reservation, your contract is considered null and void in our eyes and you must leave the property or you can be arrested for trespassing if the host wishes to press charges. I had totaled my car when I hit a patch of black ice in a previous snowstorm, slid into a curb and snapped my front suspension on the left side of my car, so I was forced to take the light rail to work for the time being. Luckily I live right next to a light rail station and my work was within one fourth of a mile from another. I called into the office and told them that I would be late because I had just wrecked my car and thankfully they understood. I arrived an hour later and my trainer sat me between two girls who had been chatting away in an attempt to get them to quiet down and pay attention. Needless to say, it didn't really work because the girl to my right, Lily, would just lean forward and talk as if I weren't even there. The girl to my left, Amy, would do the same and it was hard to pay attention to the instructor. There was another girl there, Susan, sitting to the right of Lily, who would try to join in on the conversations, but was just not very effective even though she had the most boisterous voice in the room. I'm pretty sure the two girls were just ignoring her mostly, as her comments seemed forced and you could tell she had no idea what she was talking about and just came across as pretentious and rude. During our first break, our conversation returned to relationships. Lily was single, but was crushing on our trainer. Amy was engaged and I was dating a girl whom I had had a crush on since I was 12 and had plans to propose to in the coming months. They both helped me plan out my proposal, things to do and things to avoid, 
and I'm pretty sure were more excited for me than I was. While we were talking in the front lobby, Susan comes up and hijacks the conversation. I have a boyfriend too, she said. He's 28 and has his own house and drives a Mustang. For context, Susan is 20 and I'm not judging her for dating someone 8 years older than her, but the more questions we asked, the more it seemed she just made this guy up. Now these weren't malicious questions, but genuine questions trying to get a better idea of who she was dating and just trying to be nice. Well, he's not exactly my boyfriend. He's married, but he says he's just waiting on the divorce papers to finalize and then I can move in with him. She rattled on. I became more and more uncomfortable with this girl as she started talking about her boyfriend. She would glance over at me, give me a once over and then continue talking as if nothing happened. It made every hair on my body stand on end. I am a firm believer that there has to be some sort of physical attraction between two people for the relationship to work out, and even if I were single, I was not attracted to this girl in any way, shape, or form. After the end of our training day, I started to make my way to the light rail station. There was about two feet of snow on the ground, so Amy offered to give me a ride home as I lived on her way. I greatly appreciated the offer and offered to fill up her gas tank beforehand as payment. Susan jumped in and asked for a ride as well, to the light rail station right by my house. Amy offered to drop her off at the light rail station just up the road, but Susan insisted on being dropped off at the one by my place. I didn't think anything of it at first, but I would be lying if I didn't say that it seemed too much of a coincidence that she wanted to be dropped off right at the one right next to my house, where there was another one so much closer. I was dropped off at my leasing office as I didn't want anyone to know exactly where I lived, and my roommate and I decided to order pizza instead of going out in the snow, and I wanted to drown my sorrows in something as I had just lost my car. Forty-five minutes go by as we wait for the pizza. I understood that it would take a little longer to get here as the weather conditions were terrible and whatnot. The pizza arrives and he hands me something else. A letter, he said, was sitting on our doormat when he arrived. I was intrigued as we had just moved in not more than a month ago and hadn't met any of our neighbors yet, so perhaps it was something from them. I wish I hadn't opened it. It was a letter from Susan. The envelope was covered in hearts and the initials J and S were in one of the hearts with an arrow through it. How did she know what building I lived in, I thought to myself, let alone apartment number. I tore the letter to pieces and threw it away without a second thought. In hindsight, it was a stupid idea, but I wasn't anticipating what would happen next. The next day at work, Susan approached me and asked, Did you get the present I left for you yesterday? My only response was, How did you find out where I lived? I used my admin credentials to access your test listing you created yesterday in training. I hope that's okay, she said, trying to act all shy and innocent. Uh, it's not. What is wrong with you? I swear to God, if you ever come to my house again, I won't hesitate to call the cops. I shouted back. I was livid. Not only was that a gross invasion of my privacy, she knew I had a girlfriend and had plans to propose soon. Two weeks went by and Susan would constantly come up while I was talking with Lily and Amy, insert herself into our conversation, and turn them into conversations about her and her boyfriend and all the kinky sex that they have now that the divorce papers were finalized. I'm not one to judge people's fetishes or sex lives, but I really don't care to hear about all the dirty details, especially at work. Not to mention, our conversations were nothing along the lines to begin with. We would talk about relationships, yeah, but the topic of sex never came up. Susan would constantly message me on Google Hangouts, as that is what we used to get in contact with each other on the production floor, as our phones were not allowed because we have access to our users' personal information the address, last four digits of their credit card or bank account, depending on if they were a host or a guest. So that was our only method of communication while at work. She would send me messages like, I'm sorry, please forgive me, and I just really like you and didn't know how to tell you. Can we just start over? I would ignore these messages and I eventually ended up blocking her altogether since the messages became much more aggressive as time went on. Why don't you like me? It's because I'm fat, isn't it? Why won't you answer me? I'd let you do anything you wanted to me. Just say the word. I'll come over. What's your problem? Any guy would be lucky to have me. And the most disturbing of them all. I'll just tell them you raped me if you won't let me come over tonight. I blocked her after that and went to HR with my complaints. 
I told HR about her stalking and using her admin privileges to access my personal information, and at first, nothing happened. I was brushed off and was told the usual, oh, it's just a girl crush, she'll get over it, and in a way, you should be flattered. After all, guys can't be the victim of sexual harassment, right? One more month goes by and I was actually promoted to tier 2. Not really a promotion, they made me go, and I wasn't even getting paid more for the transition, even though it included much more responsibility, such as mediation between hosts and guests involving their disputes. All four of us, Amy, Lily, and Susan, were all put on separate teams, thank God, but she would follow me to the drinking fountain and would just stand behind me, then go sit back down after I left. Wouldn't drink, just stand. Two weeks later, I get called into HR's office. I breathe a sigh of relief and think this is finally over. I was wrong. I've been told that Susan has filed charges of sexual assault against me, saying I tried to rape her in the bathroom. I was dumbfounded. I asked them what proof they had, and they said they don't need any and her word is good enough. After all, why would someone lie about something like that, right? I'd have every reason to try to hide something like that while Susan is brave for coming forward. I tried to leave, but security stopped me at the door. I pushed past them and said, I know for a fact that these rent-a-cops can't charge me for anything, so until that happens, I'll be at my desk. They let me go and I ran back to my desk, hoping that by blocking Susan on Hangouts, the messages weren't deleted as well. Thank God they weren't. I had been taking screenshots of everything she had sent me over the past three months, and two police officers showed up about ten minutes later. As they were putting handcuffs on me, I shouted at them, My computer screen! Look at my computer screen! All eyes were on me. The 250 people on the production floor had stopped talking. Most of them put their customers on hold so they could see what was going on. One of the police officers sat down at my desk and started looking over the messages. After what seemed like an eternity, he gets up and says, Let him go. They bring Susan over and the same police officer looks her dead in the face and says, I want the truth. Did this guy rape you? She nodded her head and the police officer replied, Really? So care to explain this message you sent two months ago stating that you were going to say he raped you if he didn't let you come over to his house? She started crying tried to say it wasn't true and that I had been the one making sexual advances towards her when she wasn't interested. Thank God the cop wasn't buying it. He said, Young lady, we have all the evidence we need right here to disprove your claims. However, if you still insist that he raped you, we can investigate. Keep in mind that if it's found out that you were lying, you'll be in a lot more trouble than he is right now. She insisted that I raped her yesterday in the woman's bathroom so I was officially arrested and brought in for questioning at the police station. They did a rape kit on her, and the cops asked for a DNA sample to compare it to the rape kit sample they took. I, of course, gave it to them and spent the next two days in jail. My family was notified, but I informed them that there was no point in spending the money on bail as I knew I was innocent. On the third day, I was released. No charges were being filed against me as Susan admitted that she had made the whole thing up. I was asked if I wanted to press charges for the false accusation and try to get a defamation case against her. I declined and was happy that she had been fired and settled for a restraining order. My girlfriend ended up breaking up with me because of all this, saying that she could never trust me again even though I was found innocent. I guess on the bright side, I was able to return the ring and put the funds towards a new car. My lease ended a few months later and I moved across town got a new job and pray every day that I never see her again. A few years ago, my partner and I moved from the East Coast to the Pacific Northwest. We didn't know anyone in the city. We just saved up a decent chunk of money and hopped on a plane. It was exciting and we certainly haven't regretted it. The plan was to stay at hostels and cheap hotels until we could find work in an apartment. Finding work was actually quite easy for us. We had new jobs within a week of getting off the plane. Finding somewhere to live, though, was a nightmare. Everywhere we looked had incredibly steep requirements for credit scores and minimum household income. 
We tried more legitimate sites at first, but after two months of hopping around to different hostels and motels, we became desperate, so we decided to try Airbnb. Many of the listings we tried gave us just as much trouble at first. So one day, I'm desperately scouring Airbnb for temporary rooms, and I come across one that seemed a little weird. The poster said that he had a very large house in a nice neighborhood, and that he wanted to rent out a 500 square foot room for $600, and that he would be willing to let us stay there for an entire month, utilities included. In this city, that was suspiciously cheap. He also wrote it in a rambling sort of way. It was almost half an ad for a room, and half an open letter to everyone that had recently accused him of being creepy. Now obviously, if we weren't so desperate, we wouldn't have even considered contacting this man, but we thought that we might have been at risk for running out of money before we could get in somewhere at this rate, so we gave him a call. On the phone, he sounded relatively normal. He actually suggested that we meet up with him in a public place to talk about the room first. We agreed to meet him at a restaurant near the hostel we were staying at, though we didn't tell him which one of course. He showed up late and looked surprised to actually see us there. He sat down and talked for a long time. I say he talked, rather than we talked, because he rambled non-stop about himself and how he felt persecuted by everyone in the city. He claimed to be an artist and a collector. In between him repeating himself many times about how the locals just don't understand his passions, he also told us the room he had advertised was currently filled with his collection. He never once said what he had collected, and that if things went well, he would have to hire people to move it into storage before we could move in. And at one point, he stopped talking abruptly and ran to the restroom. We took this opportunity to discuss the situation. We knew at this point that he was probably a crazy person, but the threat of homelessness was looming, so we agreed that we should at least see the place and decide based on that. He came back to the table sweaty and flustered. We weren't sure why at the time, but we figured it out later. Before we could say anything, he blurted out, I want to show you the apartment right now. We were surprised by this, but we had just discussed seeing it, so we agreed. I asked him to text me the address and that we would take public transportation to meet him there. He insisted that he drive us there since we didn't have a car. Now, we were obviously hesitant to get in his truck. It was obvious even to him, I think. But the previously mentioned desperation was still a thing and we were pretty sure he wasn't going to try to hurt us. We were right, but it was still a bad decision in retrospect. So we crammed into the front seat of his tiny, rusty, ancient looking pickup truck. My partner was pressed up against the door and I was uncomfortably close to the driver as he continued his babble about how this city had gone downhill and how everyone he used to hang out with shuns him these days. At one point I whispered to my partner to get ready for a possible tuck and roll situation. He saw me whispering but couldn't hear me over the wind roaring through the cab of the truck. One of the windows was broken out, really added to the vehicle's charms, and he said something about how we were romantic together and that he envied our youth. We arrived at his house minutes after. He had been technically honest up to this point. His neighborhood was decent looking and his home was a pretty large one-story ranch house. I noted out loud that he had bars on all of his windows and several locks on his front door. He said that this collection was very valuable to him and that he was just protecting it from thieves.
I'm a bartender, and to me, bartending is about so much more than just serving drinks. It's about community. So you can only imagine how heartbroken I was when the pandemic hit and we were basically forced to just close our doors indefinitely. I tried to find other sources of income. I even tried running a cocktail delivery service for a while. I did okay, but just not nearly enough to live comfortably. I was looking at having to sell my car, pawn a guitar or two, but the final straw came when it looked like I might have to put my dog up for adoption. I can put up with a lot of nonsense, man, but the idea of having to take Ripper to the pound, never. I just couldn't. That's when I got desperate. Desperate enough to consider something pretty drastic. To make it clear, I'm a guy in my late 20s, not completely awful looking, but definitely not Brad Pitt. So I'm sure it'll come as no surprise to many of you when I say that my financial salvation came when I started a, yep, you sure could guess it, an OnlyFans account. It all started when I heard two of my friends talking about dad bods. Dad bods, I remember saying. You'd for real prefer a beer gut to a six pack? Okay, not like a beer gut, she said with a giggle. But like, I don't know, like, the slightly out of shape look, it just feels real, and besides, gym rats just don't seem fun, you know? Dad bods are like, chill. That was probably some bad phrasing on my part, but you get the picture. The whole dad bod thing had been around for a while, but when I told the girl she must have something of a niche interest, she just laughed. Nope, it's way more popular than you think. And she brings up this OnlyFans profile of some Nick Offerman looking dude who had like a ton of posts up, all with a buttload of likes and comments. This guy makes thousands of dollars a month. His profile is free to sub too, but he does a bunch of request stuff too. Watch. I'm like, no, 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 no. Thinking she's about to show me this guy's junk or whatever, but no. Apparently the guy did like tuck you in videos or good morning sweetie videos where he pretends to wake up next to you before offering you breakfast and stuff. It was the tamest adult content imaginable, legitimately PG-13 stuff and he was charging upwards of $50 for a personalized video. The whole rest of my shift I kept thinking about that guy, thinking how happy he must be to get all this money and his following was so wholesome too. What's not to like about a setup like that? Sure, I bet there was some steamier stuff behind a paywall somewhere, but come on. A few thousand bucks a month just to tell some girl to sleep well? Why couldn't I get a piece of that sweet, sweet OnlyFans money? But nah, I'm not that guy, or at least I wasn't. I had all the confidence of a two-day-old fawn back then, but then again, I suppose desperation drives us to do stuff out of the ordinary. It was pretty surreal setting up the account. Like I had to come up with a fake name and a tract of username, I had to take a display picture selfie and banner picture. It was a whole thing. I was doubting myself the entire time, but I still went and did it, and since all the pictures were as anonymous as I could make them, those masks helped to protect more than just my breathing, I suppose, I wasn't all that concerned about getting found out. Besides, that would pretty much be the end of the whole thing. It wasn't like I was going to actually get any followers or anything, right? Right? Well, wrong. Because maybe three days after, just when I was starting to forget about the whole thing, I get an email notification from OnlyFans that says, like, User 7876 is now following you, just to be as generic as possible. I'd set up my sub fee to $4.99, then when I checked the payout section, boom. Like $4 was headed into my bank account at the end of the month as an upfront charge. I also had a direct message that just read, Loving your pictures. Can't wait to see more. X. I couldn't tell who the person was. There was no bio on their account. Nothing to even clue me into if they were male or female, but still. I just reply, Thank you so much. If you know anyone who might enjoy my content, please share my profile with them. I get a, Will do in return then that's that. A few days later, I get another sub, then another, and by the end of the week I have a grand total of 10. Loyal but totally anonymous subscribers. The extra $40 a month was paying for most of Ripper's dog food by that point. Not the good stuff, but 
I didn't have to consider giving him up anymore, and that meant you can bet your butt I carried on posting. If the only way was up, then up I was going. By the end of my six week of OnlyFans, I had just short of 50 followers and was making just under 200 bucks a month, and I put that down to solely me opening myself up to special requests. A lot of them came in the form of daddy stuff, which is undeniably kinky, but still mostly just sweet and affectionate. I didn't have a problem with it at all, and once I'd gotten a little confidence under my belt, I'd go so far as to say that I got pretty good at it. But as it turned out, the real money was in a kind of domination that was considerably less wholesome. Some people didn't want me to just be nice to them. They wanted me to be really, really mean. I remember the first time I started to feel really disillusioned with the whole thing. One special request wanted me to make a video where I basically just downright was abusive. Then when I read that they wanted me to call them all kinds of slurs, I just felt gross. It was the first time I'd had actual confirmation that some of my subscribers were gay guys, but that wasn't really it. It was the things they wanted me to call them. They're what made me feel deeply uncomfortable. I replied to the DM saying, Sorry, I can't do that. Is there anything else I can work in for you? But no. The reply was almost instant, and it consisted of them just doubling the dollar amount they were offering. The first time they did that, I actually got a little offended. Did they honestly think that I'd just cave because they flashed some cash? It was about principle, not making money. So you can guess how straight up gross I felt when they threw a four-figure amount at me. And I... I feel gross just typing this, but... Yeah, I accept it. I called them some of the most despicable things that have ever come out of my mouth. And you know, I did a pretty good job of it too. I wanted that money. And it's honestly shameful how quickly I abandoned my principles. I felt bad, really bad, for like a few days, but when another offer came in from a different user asking the same thing for the same price, I just couldn't say no. The bar wasn't even paying us any sort of unemployment anymore. We were like three months into lockdown and the money just sort of dried up. So by then, whether I liked it or not, I was almost entirely dependent on OnlyFans for my income. And when the requests got worse, I had little choice but to fulfill them. Looking back, I shouldn't have let it escalate. I could have kept things at the level they were at and still lived pretty comfortably until the New York City bar scene opened up again. But no, my greed took over and at one point, I bought an entire pack of wet Italian sausage just so a guy could imagine what his junk would look like after I stamped on it in steel-toed work boots. I thought this was as bad as things would get. I was wrong. The red line event for me was getting a follower from another user 827484 style account, the anonymous kind you always get the weirdest DMs or requests from. The guy threw an obscene dollar amount at me, but also mentioned that some of that money was for procuring materials, as he put it. Long story short, this person wanted me to head down to an apartment building where a Hispanic lady was selling puppies. I was to go down there, pick one up, then bring it back to my apartment. I asked why, but they wouldn't tell me. They just gave me some spiel about being genuine and being a huge source of potential income in the future. But this was a puppy. Nothing good could have come out of mixing only fans and baby animals. And what do you know? I was right. I won't go into too much detail about what this user wanted me to do, but it was some of the most evil heinous stuff I'd ever heard. They wanted me to hurt the puppy. Not just kill it. Hurt it. Over the course of days, maybe even weeks from some of the stuff that they were DMing me. When I outright denied their request, the threats began. Whenever I blocked an account, another one would pop up and pay the sub fee, knowing it would be returned when I inevitably blocked them. And by the time I started getting scared that this person or group of people I could never tell would get a hold of my contact details, I had to be brave enough to just click that little delete profile button and face the music. So, I'm currently living with my mom and her boyfriend out here in New Jersey. I can't actually describe how much it sucks to be living in a garage with my 
30th birthday fast approaching, but I also know my life could be so much worse. Every time I miss Williamsburg, every time I miss having my bank account being padded for next to no work at all, I just look over at Ripper, give him a pat and think, yeah, COVID has sucked. It's ruined a lot of lives, including mine. But at least, I have my pupper. I started an OnlyFans account a few years back now, and I've been recognized a grand total of three times because of my tattoos. I keep them covered up in my job because it's the kind that really doesn't like you showing off ink like that, let alone how badly they'd freak if they knew I had an OnlyFans. The point is, I like to be discreet, and my subs, for the most part, seem to understand that. The first time was about a week after my birthday. I told my subs that it was my birthday month to be discreet whilst still raking in the birthday tips. So although they didn't know exactly when I was born, they knew it was like roughly that time of the year. I had one guy give me a few looks on the subway, which isn't totally out of the ordinary if I'm honest, but just before he got off, he barely even looked at me as he said, happy birthday, and called me by my username. Like I said, he didn't make it obvious who he was talking to. He just ghosted immediately after and there was no other interaction. I mean, if you're going to get recognized for OnlyFans, you could do way, way worse than that. Second time was by a guy who literally screeched to stop on his bike, pedaled back to look at me, then turned bright red and said, oh my god, then literally zoomed away like I was going to attack him or something. Granted, he could have been just having a moment, but trust me, when you have an OnlyFans, you just sort of know where people recognize you from. Anyway, now for the third time, and by far the worst time, I don't show my face on my OnlyFans, but... I did used to show my tattoos, though not anymore. God bless those cute arm sleeve things. So this one time a guy stops, visibly starts checking out my tattoos before he kind of gasps and looks up at me. I just play it cool like there had been some kind of mistake. There blatantly hadn't and just ignore him while I carry on reading and drinking my coffee. I half expected him to keep moving but he didn't. He sat down next to me and started calling me by my username. I'd never been confronted like that, and it didn't exactly put me in the mood to be like, oh hi, yeah it's me. So I continued to deny it while also shooting him this look that tried to say, dude stop, it's me sure but please just shut up. But then he reacts in such a horrid, violent way like, what, you think I'm dumb huh? You'll take my money? the money I work my butt off for and you won't even acknowledge me in the street? That was his cue to just go off, and this guy just tore into me while an entire coffee shop and passers-by looked on. I'd rather not give him the satisfaction of repeating what he said or go into detail about how much it hurt my feelings, but I'll put it this way. I spent almost $90 on arm sleeves to cover up my tats and I haven't been recognized since. It really did mess with me for a while though, like the reoccurring thought was, you were lucky he found you in the day, if that had been the night on some dark street somewhere, I might not have been nearly as lucky, and I might not have walked away, at all. First of all, let me say this is not an indictment of OnlyFans. If someone wants to profit from sharing pictures of themselves or their body, that's totally their right and I respect that. I'm not casting judgments on anyone who chooses to do so. But let me be clear, OnlyFans just about ruined my life and I've never even set up a profile. It all kicked off not long after I broke up with a guy I'd been dating for about three to four months. As a single mom, it's way harder to get dates than I'd like it to be, but at the same time, I totally understand why someone wouldn't want to raise a child that isn't theirs. I mean, I wish more guys would be open to it, it's not like I'd never have a kid with them too, but it's just a sad fact that it puts guys off when you've got a child from a prior relationship. So you can imagine how excited I was when I met Richard. It's not his real name, but I'd rather not attract his attention, thank you very much. Having a six-year-old son didn't seem to bother him in the least bit, and 
He even asked a lot of questions about him. I found the whole thing so refreshing and mature that by the time Richard asked me out, I just about bit his arm off accepting the invite. But then the first red flag appeared when he started making comments about my son calling him Daddy. That wasn't the red flag in and of itself, it was more his reactions when I told him, no, my son has a dad and I don't want him confused as he grows up. Richard didn't seem to respect that position whatsoever and actually said some quite personal things regarding my taste in men, as well as the integrity of my son's father. It's a complicated situation, I'll concede that, but Richard's take on the whole thing was frankly disgusting and misogynistic. But given that it was a very unusual setup, I didn't want to give up on him so quickly, not since guys like him seemed to be so hard to come by. But then, after two months of clashing, not often I should add, I had to face the music and accept that if there was a guy out there for me, it certainly wasn't him. I've dated guys for 18 months who took the breakup better than Richard. They're always rough, but I think if I actually told you what Richard did, you'd think that I was making this all up. Needless to say, his reaction totally justified my decisions to end things. End things, and that's exactly how I phrased it too. But that breakup was far from the end of my ordeal with Richard. And you know what? It's kind of my fault too. In fact, it's mostly my fault. Because if I hadn't been so trusting, I wouldn't even be writing this right now. The one big mistake I made was trusting Richard to keep private certain pictures I'd sent him. I think I trusted him because, well, he sent me pictures of him too. I think that's why there's a lot less nude leaks than there are nudes. It's like Americans and the Russians in the 80s, mutually assured destruction. You release mine, well, I'll release yours. But after we broke up, I deleted all of his intimate pictures and I was foolish enough to think that he'd also done the same. Because the next thing I know, I got a message from a friend of mine saying something like, Oh, you have an OnlyFans. You go, girl. I had to ask her what OnlyFans was. I literally had no idea at the time. She replies like, you're joking, right? Was this supposed to be a secret? Immediately, I start googling OnlyFans, and as you can imagine, I'm pretty shocked at what I see. The whole website is basically homemade lewd images, and for those that aren't familiar and from what I could gather, the girls in question make quite a lot of money too. I mean, I wouldn't say no to an extra two grand a month, but I hadn't set up a profile, had I? I asked my friend to send me anything she's found with my name on it, then... What do you know? There's a freaking OnlyFans profile set up in my name, and the whole preview picture in the banner was a raunchy picture that I'd sent to Richard. The profile said, like, free to subscribe, so I made a dummy user account to sign up, only to discover that Richard must have uploaded about 10 different pictures I'd sent to him, all with these disgusting captions that I'd rather not repeat here. I was angry, so angry but I didn't get scared until I saw that he'd put up my home address. My actual home address, apartment number, postcode, everything. It kicked in how much danger I was in, and I just burst into tears thinking that my own selfish actions had exposed my only son to danger. I know it was all Richard, and I know if he was just normal, then yeah, it wouldn't have happened. But I'm a mother, I should know better. I'm not some attention-seeking teenager anymore. I just wanted to feel wanted, though. Surely people can understand that. In the end, I managed to get the profile taken down, and I think OnlyFans and other sites like that now make you verify your identity so stuff like that can't happen again. But what if you manage to get a hold of a girl's ID or something? The system they have doesn't completely eliminate the chance of fake profiles being set up. Like I said at the start, I don't mean to judge anyone who wants to do that kind of thing. I just hope they have their safety and security in mind because, as I think we all know, there are some serious psychos out there. Based in Richmond, Texas, 33-year-old Instagram influencer and freelance model, Janae Gagne, had the kind of lifestyle that many can only dream of having. Having amassed over 2 million followers on her various social media profiles, 
Gagne reportedly netted a six-figure income as a result of her many sponsorship and endorsement deals. Using the pseudonym Mercedes Moore, Gagne's social media followers included the likes of Cardi B, Megan Thee Stallion, Snoop Dogg, and Meek Mill, meaning that by August of 2020, she was arguably one of the most famous social media influencers on the planet. Like many of her peers, being introduced to the website OnlyFans presented Gagne with a lucrative opportunity. Interact even more intimately with her gargantuan online following, whilst also opening up a potentially massive new revenue stream. But according to Janae's father, Mark, the titanic amount of attention she received brought just as many problems as it did benefits. We kept her real private. Not even some of her friends knew her real name, they just called her Mercedes. I moved my daughter into new apartments three times because of my insecurities, he said late last year. The sheer number of people following her online had scared me, he continued. Some of them followed her because they admired her, loved her even, but some were crazy and obsessed. It was just obviously unhealthy. So at around 4pm on Sunday, August 29th of 2020, when Mark Gagne hadn't heard from his daughter for almost 48 hours, he decided to stop by her home in Cortland Apartments to check on her. He pulled up, knocked on the door, but no one answered. Mark Gagne then pulled out his cell phone and gave his daughter a call, swearing he could almost hear it vibrating from somewhere inside. That's when he heard movement coming from inside the house. He hadn't heard from his daughter in days, and no one was answering the door to her apartment. So who was moving around inside? Mark Gagne said that he began to suspect something was horribly, horribly wrong. So in the next instant, he reeled back and sent his foot flying into the lock, kicking it open in one furious attempt. The sight that greeted him inside instantly broke his heart. There was his beloved daughter, lying lifeless at the bottom of the stairs. Her apartment had been completely trashed, and there appeared to be lipstick graffiti all over the walls of the apartment. Yet before he had a chance to read any of it, Mark Gagne heard a noise coming from upstairs. Mark says that in the heat of the moment, he thought his daughter might have fallen down the stairs and broken her neck. But hearing something coming from upstairs had him bolting up to that floor as fast as his legs could carry him. Only then did he see a man lying in a pool of his own blood, gurgling and choking with a knife stuck in his throat as the life slipped away from him. Mark demanded answers from the dying man, but it was too late. He passed away just moments after Janae's father had broken into her home. Yet in a disturbing twist of fate, Mark Gagne wouldn't be plagued by questions for very long, because after he called 911, he began to read some of the lipstick graffiti that had been scrawled on the walls. I was used for money, read one piece. I should have stayed in Florida, read another. The final piece Mark read was, I wish I never loved her. Sorry to the landlord and the family. He couldn't bring himself to read any more. Although it appeared that his daughter's murderer had been scrawling over the walls for days, he'd summed up his feeling and motive in just a few short sentences, and to Mark, it only confirmed that his worst nightmares had come to life. Janae's killer turned out to be a 34-year-old Florida man by the name of Kevin Ocorto, a man with such unhealthy obsession with Janae that he somehow managed to track her down and kill her, all before taking his own life. He did not have any kind of prior arrest record in his home state, but during the subsequent investigation, police tried to establish that he'd had any prior history of mental health issues. I don't even know how he found her, Mark Gagne later said. I guarded my daughter. I wouldn't even let her friends know where she lived. Police still don't know how or when he got to Texas. There's so much that's still a mystery. The news of her death was broke by a Canadian rapper, Tory Lanes, who paid tribute to her with a post that read, Rest in Peace Queen. But few of the tributes seemed to address the causes of her death. She was very cautious about her surroundings, Janae's mother, Janetta Grover, said. But unfortunately, someone basically was stalking and killed my baby. It's irrefutably horrific and abhorrent that Kevin Acorto was able to track down and kill such an innocent young woman, but it's clear that Mark Gagne's fears were justified. No matter how much he tried to keep his daughter safe, 
the determination her stalkers showed in locating her significantly outweighed their efforts, and somehow, a man who wasn't exceptionally computer literate was about to somehow track down her home address. Some have speculated that De Corto somehow got hold of Janae's billing information and discovered her real name and address in that way. In which case, OnlyFans has a long way to go before it can truly secure its content creator's privacy and security. So maybe, until then, the risks of having an alluring online presence will outweigh any potential financial reward. In September of 2020, a 20-year-old Australian university student posted a harrowing personal account to the popular social media site, Reddit. In it, she detailed the terrifying ordeal she'd been subjected to after posting intimate pictures of herself on a social media page known as OnlyFans, one involving obsessive stalking, internet loopholes, and ultimately, a clear and present threat to her life. Only through a completely anonymous throwaway account did she feel safe enough to share her story, adding that her local police force had finally taken action against the person responsible. But even then, the girl made it clear that her complaints should have been taken seriously long before she was in any imminent danger. According to the girl, the incidents all started after she moved back with her parents during the summer break. The girl was particularly excited to be home as the family had just bought a new puppy. By all accounts, the girl was having a ball getting to know her new furry friend, but as anyone who's ever had a puppy will tell you, to say they can be erratic would be the understatement of the century. One night, the girl awoke to hear her puppy yelping at the back door. They were in the middle of potty training, but the pup didn't quite have the hang of it yet. So she climbed out of bed, put on her slippers, and went downstairs to let the dog out. She says it was as late as 2 a.m., and there didn't seem to be another soul around as she stepped down into the night. But she soon found that she wasn't entirely alone. I saw this figure in a car, she said. I could tell they were looking at me, but it was pitch black outside, and I couldn't make out their face. I felt a bit uneasy, but I didn't really think anything of it. Only when I go back inside, the car started up, and followed me up my driveway. The terror of such an experience is undeniable, and even though the girl was so close to home, there's no denying that being out alone in the middle of the night made her very vulnerable indeed. I was terrified, the girl added. I sprinted back inside and locked the door, and kept an eye out for them in case they tried to break in. But as far as I know, they just backed out of our driveway and left. When she woke up the following morning, after a terrible night of restless sleep and deep concern, the girl found an envelope inside her parents' letterbox. The envelope contained not only 20 Australian dollars in cash, but also her OnlyFans username. I thought long and hard about how he could have found my parents' address, the girl said, and I worked out that the problems didn't start until I shared my Amazon wish list. Only fans and Amazon were both adamant that their security systems prevent leaks like that from taking place. However, it appeared that wasn't the issue, as third-party sellers are not bound to the same data protection laws as large multinational companies. Although she doesn't know for certain how her stalker got her address, the girl is 90% sure that they got in touch with a third-party seller and obtained her home address in that way. Whether it was money, coercion, or intimidation that caused the seller to give up the info is another question entirely, but the fact remains that it's the most likely of all explanations. After that, when I moved back to the college town where I was studying, I stopped posting content, the girl goes on to explain. But somehow my stalker still managed to track me down. The girl said she basically closed down her OnlyFans account then started a YouTube account because of how unsafe the former felt. Her first big vlogging project was due to be a shopping trip to a local mall, but when she got to her car to depart for the day, she found it had been ransacked. The vlogging camera was missing too, she said. I know, it's my fault for leaving it in the car, but I was using it the night before and since I lived in a gated area I didn't think I would be unsafe. Yet she added that the camera was inside of her glove box 
and contain an SD card with unreleased photos and videos on it. It was almost like someone knew it was there, but as bad as that was, it only got weirder from there. She eventually contacted her building security personnel, asking if they could review security camera footage from the previous few nights. And it was through this that not only did she see a man break into her car and ignore other cars in the parking lot, but she also had proof she was being deliberately singled out for targeted harassment. After they got the camera, they walked around the duplex until stopping near my window, the girl wrote. My bedroom faces an outside street and the blinds are broken so it's very easy to see in. I have a curtain but it doesn't cover my window all the way. Look, what I'm trying to say is, this person watched me sleep for an hour or so. I have no idea why they didn't try to break in but thank god they didn't. The woman explained her camera was later recovered at a nearby secondhand store, suggesting whoever is stalking her has a prior history of criminality. However, she added that the camera's memory card was missing. I know he kept it as some kind of trophy, I just know it, she added, and has since moved and hopes her stalker hasn't followed. I believe the police are still trying to track them down, but I have broken my lease and moved to a new place, so hopefully this will keep me safe. But what's so scary about the girl's story is that it seems like only a matter of time before the stalker decides to take things further. Unless they're caught, stalkers will only ever escalate their activities until their obsession reaches a deadly and permanent end. This took place two years ago, and I can still recall every moment in almost perfect detail. It was nearing the end of school, everyone was on their way to their last period, which for me was history. A class that I not only wasn't good at, but I also disliked the teacher, and at that point I honestly had no motivation of even showing up. So ultimately, I decided to ditch and hide out in one of the bathroom stalls located near the very back of the school. Almost no one went back there, so I figured no one would find out anyway. I was in the furthest back stall, playing some game on my phone, when the ear deafening sound of the principal coming over the intercom made me jump. Lockdown, lockdown. This is an emergency alert. Please follow lockdown procedures. Go into the nearest room or building, lock the door, and turn off all lights. It was a lockdown announcement. Though I honestly didn't pay it any attention, considering they were all practice, and so I just continued to sit there in the stall and wait. But just then, all the lights to the building seemingly shut off all at once. The hum of the light faded, along with the buzzing of the AC unit, which meant all the power to the school had been cut off. The bathroom had gone pitch black, and that's when I was actually starting to get worried. Power was never cut off during practice lockdown drills. I texted my friend asking him what was going on, and literally right away he answered back with the text saying, Dude, where are you? It's a real lockdown, everyone's asking where you are. I told him I was in the bathroom, and he responds saying I should hide, but where else could I go? I wasn't just going to run out into the hallway to find a better spot, so ultimately I decided to stay and hide in the stall I was in. I turned my phone's brightness down and texted my friend again. I asked him what the reason was for the lockdown, and after 5 long minutes of waiting, he replied saying that apparently there was a kid armed with a knife banging on classroom doors and asking to be let in. Both my classroom and the bathroom I was in were on the same floor, so I turned off my phone and tried my best to see if I could hear anything. There were running footsteps, and that was shortly followed by the sound of the bathroom door opening. I was absolutely horrified at what I was hearing. Whoever entered walked towards the stall next to me, went inside, and shut the door. I held my breath for what seemed like forever. Then, to break the silence, in a shaky voice, I said, Who's in here? It was silent for a second, and then I heard a voice reply with, I'm just looking for a place to hide. I heard there was a lockdown over the speakers. That didn't really answer my question, but the guy sounded around my age, and so I decided I'd just let it go. We sat in silence for what seemed like forever, when finally we got another announcement telling all students to exit the school in an orderly fashion through the front doors where cops would be waiting outside. I exited the stall, but was surprised to see the guy next to me didn't. I asked him if he was coming, 
and he replied saying, Uh, yeah man, just give me a couple minutes. I thought that was weird, but regardless, I left the bathroom and started heading towards the front exit of the school. As I was walking, my phone went off. My friend had texted me. He said that apparently a kid who was maybe a couple years older than us tried to rob a nearby gas station at Knife Point. The guy actually stabbed a couple people, and when he was unsuccessful in getting any money, he ran to hide in our school to blend in as one of the students. But what horrified me the most was the last sentence. My friend said that the cops outside were saying that the kid was still inside, and that he was hiding somewhere in the back of the school. Reading this changed my walk to the front doors into a full-on sprint. Right as I got outside, I would frantically inform one of the police officers of what I had experienced. And after they searched the bathroom, they found it was empty, but that the window inside was broken. The kid had broken and escaped through the window. Needless to say, for the next few school days, I had gotten a lot of unwanted attention because of what I had experienced. As far as I know, the kid still hasn't been caught, and it's still just difficult for me to come to terms with the fact that I was unknowingly hiding in a stall right next to the guy I was trying to hide from. I somewhat recently got my first real job as a teacher at a public elementary school in a nearby neighborhood. It was the first school year I was teaching, and at this point it was only September, so needless to say, I was still learning the ropes. It was honestly pretty stressful. I teach a first grade class of around 20 kids, so you can imagine how chaotic it would get at times, especially with my lack of experience. I remember one day, I was in the middle of assigning the kids a worksheet for spelling simple words when the principal's voice came over the school's loudspeaker and ordered a lockdown. Now, uh, being a new teacher, I wasn't yet informed of when the school had practiced lockdown drills around the year. Therefore, I had no idea if this was a drill or not. But I knew either way I had to follow protocol. I turned off the room's lights, locked the doors and windows, and had the kids sit against the walls out of sight. I'd say maybe five minutes passed of complete silence when I could faintly start to hear doors being banged on down the hall. I could feel my heart start to race, as the sounds got louder, as whoever was banging on the doors got closer. At this point, I still had no idea whether it was just the principal checking all the classroom locks, or an actual intruder in the school. But my thoughts were interrupted by one of my students bursting out crying. It was too loud. There's no doubt whoever was outside would have been able to hear it. I could tell. The banging outside stopped in response to the noise, shortly after followed by a single pair of footsteps walking up to the door. It was silent for a few seconds, but the silence was quickly broken by a male's voice yelling out, Hey guys, I think there's kids in this one. And that confirmed this lockdown was real. More footsteps could be heard running up to the door. And that's when genuine attempts to break down the door were made by multiple people. At that point, not a single kid in the class wasn't crying or screaming in fear. I didn't know what to do. I was never trained for this kind of situation. And that's when two gunshots could be heard. But it didn't come from the intruders. Police were now inside the building. Right after the shots were fired, the intruders could be heard running down the hall. 30 minutes later, and we were given the all clear. It turns out the intruders were three local high school students. They were eventually caught, but when asked why they did it, they would say close to nothing. Although, one of the kids claimed it was a bed, but personally I don't believe that for a second. No bed is worth going to court over and even possibly losing your freedom. I firmly believe they had much worse intentions. Although most likely traumatized, luckily no one was physically hurt. The shots that were fired by the police were claimed to have been warning shots, and were aimed directly into the ground. It's been two years since this all happened, and I still teach first grade at the same school, and even in the same classroom. And to this day, those bullet holes can still be seen in the school's hallway. This happened back when I was in middle school. Technically, it was actually my last day in middle school. It was late May, and for our last day, our school would do a sort of field day where the whole school would play a bunch of games to celebrate the end of the school year. Now, back then, I used to be a pretty active kid. 
but unfortunately, due to a recent concussion, I was unable to participate in any games the whole day. I was pretty disappointed, yeah, though I did bring my DS and quickly opted to just sit inside one of the classrooms and play that, as I mean there wasn't really anything else I could do. None of the teachers seemed to mind, so there I was, all by myself in the classroom for my science class playing my DS, all the while the other kids got to play games in the school's gymnasium. It was a weird feeling being in that classroom alone. I don't really know how to explain it. I mean, up until that point, I don't think I'd ever been in a classroom completely alone. Something that needs to be mentioned is that the teachers that weren't watching the kids in the gymnasium were in a room across the hall having meetings. I'd say I was playing on my DS for not even an hour when my English teacher, Miss Allen, rushed up to the classroom's door and closed it from the outside. She didn't say anything to me, so I figured she just wanted to make sure I couldn't hear whatever the teachers were talking about across the hall. Forgetting about it, I went back to playing my DS. A couple minutes later, the classroom's door swung open. I expected to see one of the teachers coming in to check on me, but no, a man I'd never seen before walked into the room and closed the door behind him. The guy had to have at least been in his 50s, and so I just assumed it was some kid's dad. It wasn't unusual for parents to come into the school to bring a student their lunch, so I asked if he was looking for someone. He replied with no, in a tone that seemed almost offended that I would even ask that question. Before I could say anything else, the guy started walking towards me. I asked him what he was doing, and that's when he lifted up his shirt, revealing a handgun on his waistband. He followed it up by saying, Look kid, I'm gonna need you to come with me, or I'm gonna kill you. The guy said it in the most carefree tone I had ever heard, and that along with the fact that I had never even seen a gun in person before, instantly overwhelmed me with pure fear. Before I could fully comprehend the danger of the situation I was in, the guy firmly grabbed my wrist and started pulling me towards the classroom door. But before we got into the hallway, the deafening sound of our school's lockdown alarm started going off. This was followed by the guy instantly letting go of my wrist and making a run for it down the hall and through a back exit. I stood there in shock for a second, but ultimately went back inside the classroom. I'm not sure how much time had passed, when Miss Allen came back into the room and told me that she didn't want to scare me, but that there had been an intruder inside the building and a lockdown which now was over had taken place. I would tell her about the man, and instantly she brought me to a police officer who was already on the premises to explain what I had experienced. It turns out the man was the whole reason the school went into lockdown in the first place. The man was reported to have been scoping out the school all morning and when he was seen getting close to the building itself, someone would call the police, which resulted in the lockdown. The guy was later caught, and would openly admit that he had been trying to scare kids into getting into his car so he could kidnap them. And this reality still horrifies me to this day. Not a day goes by where I'm not thankful for the school's alarm going off when it did. School lockdowns can be some of the most terrifying things you can experience. The general fear of what's going to happen next is very overwhelming for a lot of people, sometimes even if it's just a drill. In this video, we'll be going over three terrifying true school lockdown horror stories. If you guys do enjoy horror stories told in the first person format, all I ask is that you consider subscribing, as that's the only content we post, and we upload around four videos weekly, sometimes even more. And be sure to stay to the end of the video, as honestly all of today's stories are absolutely terrifying. With that being said, let's continue into the school lockdown horror stories. It was a completely normal, boring school day. I was in 7th period math, and the clock showed 2.45pm, which means the school day was nearly done. As it was a Friday, and spring break was just around the corner, you could feel everyone getting antsy in their seats. A lot of people had tests and whatnot, whereas my class got to have fun. We had a super laid-back teacher who loved to entertain us as much as possible. We lucked out in that sense. Me and my girlfriend Haley were messing around in the back, talking about something that occurred earlier that day. When it happened, the alarm for the lockdown went off, and the principal came over the loudspeaker. Now, for some context, typically a teacher would yell lockdown three times if it was a drill. We were always told if it was four times, it was not a drill. The reason for this was to hide the fact that we knew someone was in the building with malicious intent. Four times we heard the word lockdown. Now, I've gotten so used to hearing it only three times that I paid no attention to how many times lockdown was even said. The teacher did the usual, turning off the lights, closing the door, and ushering us to the back corner of the room where we couldn't be seen from the glass on the door. Our classroom had two doors, one at the front and one at the back. 
In the midst of all the commotion, me and Haley did the one thing you should never do in a lockdown. We snuck out of the class. We were now in the hallway on the third floor. Everything looked so weird. Not a single person in sight other than the two of us. A sort of humming noise came from the walls, indicating the school had cut all the power. I thought this was weird, as I thought it was only a drill. Hey, why would they cut off the power if it's just a drill? I asked. This was when we really started to question if it was actually a drill or not. But with us being stupid teenagers, we brushed it off as nothing. We continued roaming the halls when we started to hear a sound. We got really creeped out by this, as no one was supposed to be outside the class. Fearing it was a teacher, we ran into the nearest bathroom to hide. We ran into the fourth stall that was tucked into the corner and hid. We sort of just sat there, giggling, thinking we outsmarted the teacher. Maybe about 30 seconds had passed, and we started to hear the footsteps again, but this time much closer. My heart froze. We could tell it was right outside the door. At this point, we were sure we'd been caught. We kept as quiet and as still as possible, hoping not to make a sound. It was really weird though. The person outside hadn't come in yet, but they hadn't left either. If they left, we would have clearly heard their footsteps leaving, but we never heard them. Haley pointed this out to me, and that's when we started taking the situation a bit more seriously. The door opened, and someone stepped in. I was about to walk out of the stall and apologize for sneaking off when Haley stopped me. She whispered to me, Isn't it protocol for teachers to ask if there's anyone in the bathroom? She was right. This wasn't normal teacher behavior, and that's when the heart-dropping realization hit us. Whoever was in the bathroom with us wasn't a teacher. While contemplating what to do, the silence was broken. I know you're in there. My heart dropped as the person said that. The voice was younger, and it obviously wasn't a teacher. We were practically crying at this point, unable to hold it back. The guy was now directly in front of the stall door. He started pounding on the door, and screaming like a madman. <laughs> As this was happening though, I heard the door open again, followed by the familiar voice of my teacher, Mr. Taylor. Hey, what the hell are you doing? I heard a scuffle outside, and I immediately rushed to aid my teacher. Eventually we got the guy held down and the cops were called. Apparently, the man was an escapee from a mental asylum near the school, and thankfully, no one got hurt. I don't know if any of you guys remember a few years ago when a sort of killer clown craze shook America for a few months. Well, this all happened during that time. I always remembered me and my friends thought it was funny, and we'd always watch those clown caught on camera videos that were really popular at lunch. Although, our laughter turned into fear when we were made aware that a few of those clowns on Twitter threatened to come to our school at 11am that day and quote unquote kill all of us. Luckily, the school picked up on this, and they sent out emails to the parents that they had scheduled a planned lockdown at 10.30 that day in response to the threats. I was sitting in history class when I heard the familiar sound of the lockdown alarm, followed by the teacher rushing to the windows and door, locking and closing them. Even though initially the threat freaked me out, I wasn't worried at this point. I reasoned that it was most likely just another blank threat online, and that nothing would happen. After about 40 minutes of silence, sitting on the cold floor in the corner of the room, the emergency green flashing light turned off, then followed by the air conditioning, slowly falling silent, and then the hallway lights switched off. The school had cut the power, but why though? At this point, me and my classmates were staring at each other. We all knew that something real was going on, as the school never cut off the power unless something serious was happening. After 10 minutes or so, we could all hear a faint banging noise from down the corridor, shortly followed by heavy and fast footsteps. Someone was running down the hallway. They started banging on the lockers and screaming. At this point, a few girls started quietly crying. Just then, the most terrifying thing ever happened. One of the men, dressed as a clown, ran up to the class door, banging and screaming. Multiple people were crying now and one of my friends whispered to me in complete seriousness saying we we're all gonna die. I have no shame in admitting that this caused me to start crying too. I then heard the loud sound of glass shattering. The man had shattered the glass part of the door, and I could see his arm reaching through to try to unlock the door from the inside. I was frozen and in complete disbelief as to what I was witnessing. But luckily, my teacher reacted quickly, grabbing a piece of shattered glass from the ground and stabbing the man's arm before he could unlock the door. 
He instantly grabbed his arm back, and you could hear his screams of pain. He then quickly stepped away from the door, and his screams slowly faded down the corridor. After another two hours, the principal came on the loudspeaker, explaining everything. He said that just after 11, two men walked into the school, one holding a kitchen knife. They ran around the school, threatening to kill students and trying to break into classrooms. But once the police raided the school, only one of them was caught, and it wasn't the one who tried to break into our classroom. After the whole event, the school got over 20 buses to take the younger kids home, and the kids 9th grade and over, like me, were told to walk home in groups and call the cops if we saw anything suspicious. I had a hard week at school after that experience. I was always thinking that the men would return, this time with a gun or something, but nothing happened. This, nonetheless, will be scarred into my mind forever. Ever since the lockdown, the school has hired a few more on-campus police officers, and they've installed some auto-locking features on doors and windows. This has made me feel a little bit better in school, but this isn't just an experience you can simply forget about. I live in the middle of nowhere. The school I go to has maybe 500 students in total. It's enough for everyone to know everyone's name. Regardless, this day our school went on lockdown. That familiar, yet eerie chime of our principal's voice saying to remain in our classes until further notice rang through the building over the intercoms. His voice was surprisingly calm, especially considering the fact that he didn't even say it was a drill. Despite our little town, crime isn't completely unheard of. We've had our fair share of reported break-ins, robberies, and even some gang activity. I bet it's a robber down at Chase Bank, my friend Kyle joked. I laughed, and we started talking about what we actually thought the whole lockdown was for. Kyle's voice was beginning to get louder, only interrupted by our teacher Miss Sander herself shushing him. It had now been about 10 minutes of complete silence, but like most high schoolers tend to, we all lost our patience. Everyone was now talking softly to whoever they were sitting next to at this point. Just then, we all heard it. Footsteps. Not just one pair, but a few walking down the hall. We all went quiet, knowing that something was wrong, and if this was a drill, it would have been just one pair of footsteps, that being the teacher checking on the classrooms. Even Kyle, who had previously been talking, grew silent. Miss Sander moved slowly to the doorway, peering out from behind a corner. The heaviness in the air was suffocating. Just then, we heard footsteps again. Seemingly doing another lap around the school, a girl across the room let out a muffled sob of fear. I focused my attention on the door. I was leaning out from behind a table to peer through the window to see if I could see anything. I'm not sure what I expected to see, but whatever I was expecting, a whole lot of nothing was not it. The hallway was empty and completely dark, as it tends to be when no one was in it. The lights were all automated in my school, but just then, I noticed some of them turn on. A wave of yellow light instantly filled the room as we huddled in, casting shadows against the rows of desks. Someone somewhere tried to calm the crying girl, but I could hear their own murmured voice waver. I was still looking through the door's window from a distance at this point, but of course, as I was doing this, I saw someone walk up to the window and start looking through into the room. I instantly ducked back down behind the table the whole class was hiding behind. I felt my heart beat wildly as I heard the sound of the doorknob start to shift. My vision grew static as I pulled my knees to my chest, curling up tightly in the corner of the room. The door shook as the guy banged on it repeatedly, and as he was doing this, my biggest fear came true. The door hinges gave out, and this guy proceeded to walk into the classroom. All of us went silent, praying this man wouldn't walk over to the corner of the room and see all of us hiding behind this table. About a minute passed of just this guy standing there, and we could hear someone else sprinting to the door followed by the words, Dude, we gotta go. The cops are already here. That's when I heard the guy start running out of the room and down the hall. The cops came, and a little later that was it. The guys who entered the school were never caught, and apparently they were armed with guns. The story goes that one of the kids at my school tweeted at a gang essentially making fun of them the night before that school day. And of course, the gang took it very seriously and planned on raiding the school and killing the kid responsible. Luckily, they weren't successful. This experience still terrifies me nonetheless. I went to middle school at a private school where the middle and high school was comprised of only 30 students. One of the assistant coaches for my middle school team was a soft-spoken man that volunteered for many of our school functions. I assume this is due to the fact that he had two adopted sons that attended my school. One was a grade older and one was a couple of grades below me. 
I didn't really remember him at all until I graduated high school and out of the blue got a phone call from a number I didn't recognize. Still don't know how he got my number. It turns out to be that this man was wishing me a happy graduation. I at first thought that he was just friendly, but then he called back insisting on taking me for a steak dinner. I tried to politely decline, but he began texting me and calling me non-stop. This made me really uncomfortable, and so I sternly requested he leave me be. A couple of years later, I am a sophomore in college and I received this email. Dear me, I shall try one last time, though not to bother, but to seek a friendship that I can feel can work and benefit us both. It seems that most people pass through their lives and leave a vacant mark, soon to be forgotten, or, if thought of, just a passing blip that does not linger. However then, there are those who leave their mark as if to say, I am somebody of value, I want to make a difference. I'm not sure where or how I so tragically messed up in trying to recapture a friendship that I felt important. Not wanting anything more or anything less, but a friendship of value and a meaning that would be of importance to two lives. Long ago, as a soccer coach, there was a young man of intrigue on my team. His intelligence shone through his skills on the soccer field, and there was something there, something that sparked a thought of value. It was difficult to define, harder still to understand. Nonetheless, that young man left a mark that would stay in the portals of my mind. Typically, society does not take kindly to a grown married man taking up a friendship with a young man with a family of his own. Innocent, of course, respectfully even more, but still looked at with this inevitable stink eye. Maybe one day the paths of this coach and team member will cross again. Most of the friendships that I value in my life have come along in the most unusual way. For instance, the 19-year-old female classmate at mortuary school that just seemed to fit under my wing. I was the one that was not interested in hitting on her, just establishing a friendship that could last for years to come. Or perhaps the 93-year-old lady in the nursing home who was hungry for the company of someone that enjoyed listening to her stories of times gone by. The 70-year-old author from Casey County that immediately gave a feeling of commonality that was uncovered after just a few dinners and glasses of Merlot. A young friend of a son who, lacking a father figure, just wanted respect from a generation that was not willing to give it. I could go on and on. I have found that the old saying that you can't pick your family however, you can pick your friends is of tremendous value in my life. Souls are waiting around every corner or in the most bizarre places, but when you encounter them, the rewards are endless. What does all this mean? For you perhaps nothing, or maybe, just maybe, something. This is for you to decide. Nature may have already taken its course, but I try not to give up on anything that I consider of value in my life or the lives of others. Best regards, him. I responded extremely curtly and notified this man that I forward the email to my father, attorney at law. I don't like to speculate, but considering the nature of the adoption of the demeanor and behavior of his sons growing up as well as their age approximity to me, I really worry about their upbringing. I never heard from this man since, but my younger sister said one of her male friends has had similar interactions with him. To add to the creepiness, this man is a mortician in my county. I would like to add a bit more context to this story. I would receive multiple voicemails a day of this man telling me things like, I want to take you out to a big steak dinner, anything you want, we can even share some wine at my house before, or... I don't know what I'm doing wrong and why you are pushing me away. I think we can truly get along great. Now, I agree. At first I thought this man was simply reaching out to me in a friendly manner, but the persistence after being nicely turned down is what raised red flags. After starting college, I received a new phone number as well as a new email address. Not for this reason, but because I got my own phone plan and started university with a new email. My second year here, he tracked down both informations again. This is when he sent this letter as well as started the calls again. It was only after telling the man that I forwarded his email to my father who happened to be an attorney that he left me alone. A few months later, the county prosecutor contacted me requesting information. When I recalled this story, I did a quick Google search of his email and name and found at least two obituaries of 14 and 15 year old boys that live in different states from him where he posts on the online funeral page expressing condolences. I won't add his exact wording or the sites because I don't want to reveal his identity, 
but both were identical and went something like this. Parents, may God give you strength. I feel like I have gotten to know your son through the Facebook posts and messages we have shared and have grown to love him and have plenty of respect for him. My heart is aching. I love you. Insert son's name. It is speculative, but it sounds as if he doesn't personally know these boys and the similar wording he uses to the letter he sent me further raises red flags. And lastly, I want to reiterate that I barely knew this man. We never had an opportunity to be alone and develop some bond that he refers to. He was the assistant coach for my middle school soccer team. I rarely even made it on the field as I was in the sixth grade and it was a middle school team. It was not as if he was some teacher I saw every day and I sincerely left an impression on him. I didn't even remember he existed until the calls and emails started. In June of 1969, six-year-old Dennis Martin accompanied his family on a camping trip to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, a mountain range rising along the Tennessee-North Carolina border in the southeastern United States. The name Great Smoky Mountains comes from the natural fog that often hangs over the range, appearing as large smoke plumes from a distance. Interestingly, this fog is caused by chemicals emitted from the local flora, chemicals that have a high vapor pressure and easily form vapors at normal temperature and pressures. Yet even having heard the scientific explanation behind the phenomenon, seeing all that fog clinging to the hilltops is a very eerie sight indeed. Hailing from nearby Knoxville, Tennessee, the Martin family had a long-running tradition of celebrating Father's Day by taking camping trips to the Great Smoky Mountains. In 1969 would mark young Dennis's first trip into the woods in the company of his father, older brother, and grandpa. The group drove out to Cades Cove, an isolated valley located in the Tennessee section of the park, then hiked out towards Russell Field, where they set up camping and began preparing for their first night under the stars. The following morning, they set off for a place known as Spence Field, a picturesque highland meadow and popular camping spot which was bisected by the rolling hills and jagged mountain peaks of the Appalachian Trail. When the group arrived at Spence Field, Dennis and his older brother set off to explore the campsite and reportedly talked to many of the other campers who had pitched their tents nearby. This is how they got talking to a ragtag group made up of other campers' children who made fast friends with the Martin boys. Dennis' father was pleased to see his son getting along so well with the other kids, and having his sons occupied meant the adults could get on with the important task of assembling their four-man tent. Once the task was completed, Dennis was still playing with a group of other kids, and his father says he watched as the group gleefully took up hiding positions from which to playfully ambush a group of approaching adults. When the grown-ups entered the kids' make-believe kill zone, they all jumped out, growling and roaring like wild animals as they set upon their laughing parents. All but one. All but little Dennis. His father watched with growing concern as the seconds ticked by, and Dennis had yet to emerge from his hiding spot. Eventually, he couldn't bear it anymore, and after rising from his camping chair, Dennis's father marched off the spot where he had last seen his six-year-old son and began calling out his name. But what started out as stern, fatherly commands soon degenerated into terrified pleas, and as he continued to call out in desperation, the other families began to realize that something was terribly wrong. Once Dennis's grandpa knew he was missing, he set the group into action, sending one group two miles up the Appalachian Trail with his son, while he led another group back towards the Cades Cove Ranger Station, arriving there around 8.30pm that night. Thus began an extensive, well-publicized search and rescue operation, in which National Park Service personnel was supplemented by National Guard soldiers and even a unit of Green Berets. At the peak of the search operation, more than 1,400 people were operating in the few square miles around Spencefield, but not a single one found anything that could lead them to the missing boy. However, in the aftermath of the operation, the search efforts drew a great deal of criticism from search and rescue experts far and wide who said the large number of personnel involved potentially obscuring tracks and ground that was already difficult to track over due to heavy rain. 
Shockingly, a shoe print belonging to that of a child was actually found at one point, but the track was dismissed as belonging to one of the Boy Scouts that was helping with the search. Later, however, investigators kicked themselves when they found that the tracks were determined to have come from a child who was missing one shoe, which disappeared on the banks of a stream. Some suggesting it was possible that the tracks belonged to Martin, and this theory was supported when a discarded child-sized shoe and sock were found just three days later. Although search and rescue personnel continued their search for more than two weeks, scouring the hillsides night and day in continual shifts, no further clues to Martin's whereabouts were ever found. The Martin family was so understandably desperate for answers that they offered a $5,000 reward for any information that would reunite them with their beloved Dennis. This got the attention of a handful of so-called psychics, who some might argue sought to exploit the Martin family's grief and maybe cashing in if they guessed the right area of the Smokies to search. Surprisingly, none of these psychics ever proved to be of any help. Many years later in 1985, a man who had apparently been illegally collecting American ginseng in the park claimed to have come across the skeletal remains of a child while exploring the woods. The man said he should have reported the find, but was terrified of being prosecuted for his prohibited herbal hobby. Not only that, but he was also unable to point investigators in the direction of the site he'd found the bones in the first place. There have been many theories that have attempted to explain what happened to young Dennis Martin that day. Most detectives, both amateur and professional, believe that Dennis became disoriented whilst looking for a hiding place, maybe even forgetting his way back to camp when he emerged from it. Either way, Dennis then strayed further from the camp and could easily have fallen down one of the many steep slopes and ravines that dotted the area surrounding Spencefield. However, Dennis was wearing a bright red t-shirt when he went missing, not something that would be easy for search and rescue teams to miss. Dennis would have to be completely covered in foliage to remain undetected with that color of shirt, and despite it being feasible due to his small size, the likelihood of that is extremely low. Others are quick to remind us of the presence of black bears in the area, as well as copperhead vipers and feral pigs, all of which would have posed a considerable threat to six-year-old Martin. Park rangers told investigating police that an underweight bear had been caught in a boar trap in the Spencefield area just two weeks earlier. Although the bear was released safely, the incident suggested that it may have been struggling to find enough food, prompting to turn to a less familiar source of food. Yet however tragic and brutal the aforementioned theories are, Dennis's father believes something considerably more sinister. Based on the eyewitness account of one Harold Key, who says he heard a loud scream on the very same afternoon that Dennis disappeared, Dennis's dad firmly believed that his son was kidnapped by an opportunistic predator. Shortly after he heard the scream, Harold Key claimed to have seen a disheveled bearded man with wild unkempt hair fleeing through the woods in an apparent bid to remain undetected by the nearby campers. Harold's family went on to explain that they saw a flash of red on the figure's shoulders, which some believe was actually Dennis himself, slung over the shoulder of this mysterious figure as they carried him away. Harold later speculated that the man may have been a moonshiner, explaining his reluctance to be seen. Despite the report, FBI investigators ultimately dismissed it, saying that as much as Harold meant well, his account was frankly unreliable as his timeline of events were off. But one retired park ranger lamented the failure to properly follow up either the footprints or the sighting of the rough-looking man, arguing that as the location of the sighting was downhill from where Dennis disappeared, it was possible to cover that distance in the time frame, even carrying a child, but that the individual in question would have some impressive strength, stealth, and endurance. So if this is the case, who is this hairy mystery man, this bearded vagrant who was apparently capable of such an impressive physical feat, even if it was in the context of the despicable abduction of a child? Given the lack of investigation into his sighting or his tracks, it seems we might never know. But even if we did get to the bottom of the mystery of a man living in the Appalachian Mountains with a penchant for kidnapping children, I don't think the answers would bring us any solace. Maybe the closure would be worth it, especially for the family, but nightmares can be a high price to pay, 
and wondering what happened to young Dennis Martin can give even the most hardened true crime reader some very sleepless nights. Established in 1908 by Theodore Roosevelt, the Big South Trail is an 11-mile hiking route that winds through the rugged Comanche Peak wilderness into Colorado's Rocky Mountain National Park. Experienced hikers have described the Big South Trail as of average difficulty, but as one said, there are some areas where the ledges were only 24 inches wide. It can be really tough, and if you're not in shape, it'll take a lot out of you. Known for its picturesque beauty, the trail is also something of a wildlife haven and is home to elk, bobcats, black bears, and mountain lions, just to name a few. While average temperatures on the trail range from highs in the upper 60s in the summer to frigid lows of 10 to 15 degrees in the winter, making it perfect for both sunny and snowy outdoor activities. The area's wild natural beauty is partly what motivated brothers Alan and Arlen Atadero to found the Pudra River Resort a place for hikers and outdoorsmen of every variety to indulge in their hobby of choice. Alan mentioned that he and his brothers spent so much time there that they felt that they were becoming part of the landscape itself. So in the end, it just made sense to move their families out there. Life at the resort was relatively carefree until the fall of 1999 when a Christian singles group was helping Alan prepare for winter in exchange for free lodging. On October 2nd, the Christian singles group decided that they wanted to go visit a nearby trout farm just short of two miles from the resort itself. Alan knew several of the singles group well and since his six-year-old daughter Jocelyn wanted to join them, Alan knew that there was no way that he could give her permission without her three-year-old brother Jared wanting to tag along. So, since he trusted the singles group, Alan gave them permission to take his kids with them on their hike at about 10 o'clock that morning. Excited to be on one of his first real outdoor adventures, Jared would keep on running ahead of the group, but no more than about a hundred feet before his guardians in the singles group would call him back. At around 11.30, the group stopped to talk to some fishermen that their little boy scout had run into while on point, and after a brief conversation, they continued on down the trail. By this time, the group had begun to separate or spread out as they walked. Some people faster and some slower, with at least one adult with Jared's sister and Jared who continuously ran ahead of everybody else. Shortly afterward, little Jared rounded a corner on the trail and disappeared from view. Technically, he was no further ahead than he usually was, so his guardians didn't worry too much. But when they too rounded the corner, there was no sign of him in the little beige coat he was wearing. One of the singles groups rushed ahead to try to find the boy, but he was nowhere to be found. And as it turned out, that last image of young Jared turning the blind corner on the trail was the last time anyone would see him alive. Over the following few days, a huge search and rescue operation was mounted, but not a single sign of Jared Atadero was found. In fact, it would take almost four years for any clues of his demise to be found, but these clues seemed to only raise many more questions than they answered. After searching for approximately an hour, a few members of the hiking group rushed back to the Pudra River Resort to give Alan the bad news that his three-year-old son was lost in the woods. In a panic, Alan immediately drives out to meet the rest of the group, helping them continue to search for another hour or so. It is during this time that some of the eleven-person hiking party say that they heard some kind of high-pitched scream, including Alan's six-year-old daughter, Jocelyn. I asked her what kind of scream it was somebody getting attacked or somebody playing with someone, Alan later said. She said it sounded like a playful scream, as if someone was going up to tag him. Since it seemed like Jared was within earshot, the group continued to search intensively for him, but no matter how hard they tried, they just couldn't locate their lost toddler. So just before 4 o'clock that afternoon, Alan rushed back to the resort to call 911. Less than 30 minutes later, Larimer County Emergency Service Specialist Bill Nelson receives an emergency pager alert, informing them that a child had gone missing on the Big South Trail. In turn, Bill contacts his search and rescue manager who 
immediately musters multiple SAR teams to prepare for a large but delicate operation. Within two hours of the original 911 call being made, search and rescue personnel had boots on the ground at the Lower Big South Trailhead, with a total of 65 people involved in the search for Jared. An hour and a half into their search, rescue personnel had scoured the majority of the trail and still hadn't located Jared. As a result, the area of operations was vastly expanded, with reinforcements including Air Force helicopters due to arrive the following morning. At 7 a.m. on October 2nd of 1999, a Cheyenne-based UH-1N Huey helicopter made its first pass over the Big South Trail and remained the search and rescue team's eye in the sky until late in the morning. After returning to Fort Collins Loveland Municipal Airport to refuel, the helicopter arrived back in the search area at around 3.30 that afternoon. However, during its second patrol over the trail, the helicopter struggled with the mountain conditions and stalled out plummeting more than a hundred feet before smashing through the pine canopy near the trailhead. Aboard the Huey were four USAF servicemen, but also a representative of the Larimer County Search and Rescue Team named Mark Sheets. When it crashed, Mark was the only passenger who was not securely in a seat, as he was on the floor with the door open. He said that when he saw the rotors hit the top of the trees and pieces of helicopters sprayed into the forest, he rushed to close the door but a severed tree limb found its way into the hold and struck the Air Force doctor on board squarely in the face, fracturing the doctor's eye socket and causing blood to pour from an open wound. By some stroke of good luck, the Air Force crew was able to escape from the helicopter's wreckage, but Mark Sheets had been completely knocked out cold and was still trapped in the mass of crumbled metal that was still in danger of exploding. Nearby search and rescue members ran to the downed helicopter smashed in a window and managed to pull the unconscious sheets out before he could come to any more harm. But he had still received a severe concussion and a 13-inch L-shaped gash that left his femur exposed. Mark had also suffered three broken vertebrae in his lower back and a broken shoulder, possibly from being pulled from the wreckage so violently. The helicopter crash most definitely set the search back a great deal, but thankfully, all survived and the search efforts continued into their third day. Day 3 saw the arrival of specially trained police diving teams who explored the deep pools of the nearby Poudre River. Another helicopter was dispatched to aid the search, but encountered swirling winds that required full power to prevent crashing. This burned through the chopper's fuel supplies in no time, and it was soon forced to return to Fort Collins Air Force Base. Over the next three days, well-meaning but ill-equipped volunteers started hounding the Larimer County Sheriff's Office and Larimer County Search and Rescue to allow them to help. Three-year-old Jared had been missing for almost a week at that point, and time was running out to find him safely. They approved, and soon the number of search and rescue personnel had swelled to over 200 and included a dozen dog teams, professional trackers, a dive team, and a search plane. But even with all those bodies and assets, the search and rescue operation was a complete and utter failure as not a single usable clue to Jared's whereabouts are found. Consequently, officials are forced to notify the Atadero family that the search for Jared had been suspended. Larimer County Under Sheriff Bill Nelson hastily convened a press conference. In it, he told the gathered journalists, We worked for eight solid days to begin with, and that was 24 hours a day for eight days. We did some night searching. It was limited to a certain extent, but... We did always have people out in the field to make noise, so if somebody was out there now, Jared would have heard it. He would have maybe responded. Jane Shmievsky, a member of the Larimer County Search and Rescue Canine Unit, said that the search was one of the most intense she'd ever taken part of. She'd never been involved in the search for a child before, and although it was to be expected, she was astounded at the level of media coverage. It became a real nationwide episode, she said. So, that put a lot of stress on us, and a lot of stress on the dogs. County Sheriff Justin Smith was just a lowly sergeant back in 1999 when Jared went missing. He said the helicopter crash was an extremely stressful event, which most definitely had a negative effect at a crucial period of the search, and that the intense media interest only exacerbated the situation. 
It's worth noting that this all took place right around the time that the grand jury of the Jean Benet Ramsey case was due to hand down indictments, so the concept of children coming to harm loomed large in the national zeitgeist. Naturally, the media flocked to sate the public's appetite for answers, and at one point, 17 TV satellite trucks lined Colorado's Highway 14, and the area swarmed with reporters and camera crews sporting fur coats to protect them from the bitter Colorado cold. Meanwhile, police information hotlines were buzzing with calls, including a number of self-proclaimed psychics who claimed they knew where SAR operators could find the terrified but still living Jared. TV crews observed a Native American medicine man visiting the area who informed them he had arrived to perform a kind of ritual in which he would ask the mountain to return the boy to his parents. And in one particularly unusual but wholesome incident, a barefoot man with a mule showed up on the trail and volunteered his services in the search effort. But as much as the gesture was a heartfelt one, dog teams and aircraft had failed to find any sign of Jared, so one more pair of eyes on the ground proved of little use. As much as it hurt them to do so, rescue volunteers were forced to call off their search entirely, and for years, the case of little Jared's disappearance remained a complete and utter mystery. Cut to June of 2003, when hikers Rob Osborne and Gareth Watts were making their visit to the Big South Trail. We singled out the Poudre Canyon as an area we'd like to explore, Rob said, so we decided on getting there via the Big South Trail. We'd heard how gorgeous a hike it was, how beautiful and wild the area around the river was, and since that's the whole reason Gary and I got into hiking, we figured we'd pay it a visit. While on their hike, Rob and Gareth wound up in a rock field and decided to hike up around 2,000 feet to reach its top. It's remarkable country up there, but it really was a scramble, Gareth later said. You're constantly watching your feet. Focus on the area in front of you so you don't end up twisting an ankle or something. He and Rob had hiked areas in the vicinity before and were obviously aware of the Jared Atadero mystery owing to the amount of media attention it received and, as experienced outdoorsmen, they had spent one or two occasions theorizing on the cause of the boy's disappearance. We'd figured he'd been swept downstream, maybe taken by a mountain lion, Rob said. Obviously, there was the possibility of something more sinister happening, but it's something we didn't really talk about. Having kids of our own, it just didn't bear thinking about. But since they were hiking the exact area that Jared had gone missing, the pair felt an eerie sense of dread and couldn't keep their minds off the mysterious and heartbreaking incident. But neither must have expected the discovery they were due to make that day. Rob and Gareth usually stuck to popular hiking trails, mainly for safety purposes. But on that first visit to the Big South Trail, with the thought of Jared's disappearance in their minds, they took it upon themselves to wander off the trail. We didn't set out to find anything, Gareth added. We figured if a whole team of guys couldn't find anything, there was no way we could. But I guess there was an element of what if, you know. Then about an hour into the hike, we just walked right into it. I couldn't believe my eyes at first. But there they were, clear as day. Rob and Gareth had somehow stumbled across a set of child's clothes, more than 500 feet up the trail from where he was last seen. That's when I saw the shoe... Gareth said. It was a kid's shoe, definitely, and it was pristine, like somebody had just took their foot right out of it, you know? Fresh, like you might look up and see a kid hopping around looking for their sneaker. But then, the two hiking buddies found another matching shoe, a brown fleece jacket and a pair of blue sweatpants that had been turned inside out. In their eyes, there was no way these clothes could be Jared Atadero's. The boy had been missing almost four years by that time, and it wasn't conceivable that they could be exposed to elements for all this time. It still looked brand new. But still, just in case, the two men took photographs of the clothes and called 911 at the next available opportunity. They complied with the detective's request to email over the photographs they'd taken, which were then forwarded to Alan Atadero, who was living in Littleton at the time. The detective was stunned when he received a reply stating that the clothes did indeed belong to Jared. 
Within 24 hours, state authorities had assembled a team consisting of Larimer County Sheriff's Office members, Larimer County search and rescue officials, rangers from the Colorado Division of Wildlife, and volunteers from an organization known as NecroSearch. All were directed to meet at Big South Trailhead to start search for remains of Jared. Later, with Alan Atadero and personnel from the local Child Protection Network joining the search effort, they managed to recover the remains of the entire outfit that Jared was wearing on the day of his disappearance, which were scattered over a 25-foot area. While the cloth jacket had what appeared to be puncture marks and the pants were tattered, the nylon shoes had little weathering, leading investigators to conclude that some of the items were sheltered from the elements and some were exposed. It was the simplest explanation, but not necessarily the correct one. Then, at a site at about 180 feet north and 20 feet higher in elevation than the place the clothing was found, police made a chilling discovery. It was a tiny piece of a human being's skull, wedged into a crevice and only barely visible with the naked eye. Nearby, on a log spanning the crevice where the skull fragment was found, police also found a human tooth. At 5 p.m. that evening, Alan Atadero and other members of the search teams summoned the throngs of TV news reporters to the trailhead and announced what he and the team had found. It was most definitely a breakthrough in the case, but again, the discovery only seemed to generate more questions than it answered, and it wasn't long before people were forced to come up with their own explanations. Canadian outdoorsman Les Survivor Man Shroud said that whatever is happening up on the Big South Trail is simply beyond human comprehension. In a lot of these cases, search and rescue or the volunteers searching people have already gone over certain areas, not once, not twice, but even dozens of times, he said. And then the child is found there maybe a year, maybe a few years later. It makes no sense at all. I've been out in the woods for years now and I've seen all kinds of things, but still, I can't make sense of it all. Hiker Rob Osborne says there's a good chance the area where Jared's clothes were found was in search during the initial effort and that it was down to one simple thing. No way could a kid have climbed up to that spot on his own. No way. I mean, it was a struggle for Gary and I to get there. It was very rough terrain, so maybe the police should have searched that area the first time around, but at the same time, I can't blame them for rolling it out. Police dog handler Jane Schmiewski conclusion from the get-go was that Jared's disappearance was due to an animal encounter. I'm not sure officially what has really been released as a finality, but it pretty much points to an animal encounter. Nothing else explains how he could have been dragged up so high, unless of course it was a person that took Jared that morning. This was where SAR specialist Bill Nelson's testimony gets a little frightening. If a big cat actually took him, which is what I believe happened, it would have taken him someplace and buried him, he said. With all the activity that was going on, we probably scared it away, then it would have come back later to dig up its meal. That's why no one found nothing. The kid was underground the whole time. But then surely volunteers or police would have noticed some disturbed earth somewhere, and Jared's clothing must have showed some signs of animal attack. It's inconsistencies like those that make Alan Atadero think something else is to blame for his son's disappearance. I hear constantly about a mountain lion, he said. But when they tested Jared's clothes, there was no mountain lion hairs, no DNA, no blood, nothing on his clothes. If a mountain lion would have attacked him, they would have gone for the stomach area. His jacket would have been threads. But his jacket was fine. I've talked to wildlife experts about this, Alan said, quick to reassure those who will listen. Jared's jacket would not have survived a mountain lion attack. His shoes that were found up in the mountain, as told by investigators, do not look like they were in the wilderness for years. I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. Alan also notes that the other thing interesting about the discovery of Jared's almost spotless shoes is that they would most definitely have been scuffed up if... He had been dragged up the side of the mountain, a la mountain lion attack. His pants were found in good condition with only minor damage from rodents and birds using threads for nesting materials. A large predator would have had to tear through the small boy's clothing in order to feed, 
yet there's no signs that that was the case. One of the reports that Alan Atadero read says that the reason why that forensic examiners didn't find any DNA or blood on Jared's clothing is because either he or something removed his clothes before he was attacked. We can only imagine how horrified his father would have been reading that. That was the very last thing he wanted to hear. The report goes on to say that because there were so many hikers coming up, the mountain lion that took Alan's son then absconded with his body 500 feet up the side of the cliff. Yet the question remains, if something took Jared's clothing off before he was attacked, why was it then found around 500 feet up the mountainside? His pants were found inside out, a clear indication that they had been pulled off in a hurry and not by anything that had claws or teeth. And as we've said, it's little details like this that cause Alan and his family to believe that someone out there knows a little more about the case than they're comfortable sharing. Jared's disappearance has never been fully explained by either U.S. law enforcement or their amateur counterparts, but it's important for mountain lion theorists to keep this in mind that, since 1915, there have been a grand total of 14 reported mountain lion attacks in the U.S. and Canada that have resulted in fatality. The chances of being attacked by one are tremendously low, and even lower when you consider that Jared was part of a large group of hikers. These hikers were intensively questioned by the police, as it seemed natural that at least one of them would have been held responsible for his disappearance, but multiple homicide detectives said interviews with hiking group members showed no obvious red flags and that no evidence pointed toward their guilt. As a result of such speculation, theories seeking to explain such mysterious events have evolved from purely rational possibilities to bizarre, conspiracy theory-like explanations such as cryptid attacks or alien abduction. But as much as people keep throwing ideas at the wall, nothing is sticking. And as more and more time goes by, it looks more and more likely that the disappearance of young Jared Atadero will forever remain a heartbreaking but terrifying mystery. <laughs>